208. 208. 208. Got a winner? 208. Nobody going once, 208. Going twice. Next one, Olivia. 64. 64. The $64 question is, do we have a winner? 64. I'll give you one more time, and I'm just going to take the spices home with me. Okay, another ticket. 110. 110. Today's high temperature. 110. Nobody? You got 64. You got 64? Are you from South Texas? Yeah. Okay, well, come on up. <laughs> Gary Stevens, Wildlife Habitat Federation. Glad to have you here and a stalwart in our South Texas Bob Wild Brigade for many years. Okay, let's pull out another one for a uh, one of the Mormon knives. It's a quail symposium, two Yeti mugs, and a gift tray, and donated by a quail forever. Quail forever. 120, 122. 122. 122. Hunter Hopkins. Your wife will appreciate that. Oh, the official sausage of RPQRR, Michalik sausage. Five pounds Michalik sausage. That's about $40 worth of sausage. And a cap. 131. 131. 131. Anybody like Michelin sausage? 131. If you don't pick that up, San Angelo, holler at me and I'll eat it. And that is good stuff, folks, if you never had it. If you come to the ranch, you will have it. Okay, our next door prize is a Stealth Cam game camera donated by uh, Tex Parks, uh, donated by Stealth Cam, and a result of what you can get with a game camera taken out at the research ranch is three coyote pups drinking from a trough. So we'll sell those or market those together. And who we got now, Olivia? 142. 142. 142. 142. 142. Last chance, 142. Draw me another one, Olivia. 124. 124. All right, I got a winner. Who was it? Now, RPQR people are disqualified from the door prize, but that's not an RPQR guy. That's Zach. Is that Zach? No. Zach, okay. Also, one of our allies with South Texas Bob Wild Brigade for many, many years. Do you remember your silver bullet, Olivia? Yes, sir. Would you tell it for us? Here, I'm holding those tickets. Okay. Be true to your work, your word, and your friend by Henry David Thoreau. What's your name? Where are you from? Oh, my name is Olivia Bean, and I'm from Ballinger, Texas. And my silver bu bullet stated, "Be true to your work, your word, and your friend." And it's by Henry David Thoreau. Uh, do you all have to give a war cry as a ranch brigade? <laughs> yes. Well, give us a war cry. <laughs> all right, good job. Oh, we got one more. I'm sorry, one more. We got a gift. Uh, we got some. Woo, some styling socks here from Quail Coalition, a photographic guide to the vegetation of South Texas. And by, I'm not sure, Dana, I'm not sure who donated that. Tom Patillo, maybe? Yes. Okay, Tom, thank you. And then a shirt from Dog Down. So that goes as a package. Who's our winner, Olivia? Number 121. 121. Aren't you glad you're here rather than on 121 over in Dallas right now? Who got a winner? All right, got a winner. All right, thank you, Olivia. If you'll take those back to the booth, that'd be great. <laughs> Gonna look good in those socks. <laughs> I want to remind you that we are having dinner here tonight 
I think it's 630. <laughs> so I've heard rumors that some of you want to go to Perini Ranch Steakhouse or elsewhere, and that's we know that's great. But you do have a free dinner tonight here. It'll be by Joe Allen's. It'll be steak and chicken fajitas tonight, and I guarantee you it'll be good, too. So hopefully you'll hang around. And the silent auction closes at 730, I believe. 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock. All right, thanks, Dale. Congrats to everybody who won there. Um, before we get into our panel discussions, um, another gentleman who needs no introduction, um, Mr. Joe Crafton. Um, Joe is currently the president of the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation. He's a Quail Coalition founder, um, Park City's Quail Coalition founder, partner in Snipes Ranch, and the president of Quail Guard LLC. Joe's going to join us um, for a chat on engaging the quail hunting community. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Joe. Get that wrapped up for you. Okay, you great. Arrow keys. Okay, so mouse click on Excellent. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. I want to thank the organizers and the speakers. Um, I've, I've been quail influenced by the speakers. I've learned a lot. Um, and you got to be influenced. You can't ever get rigid and believe your beliefs and not uh, and not uh, be adjustable. I heard someone is here from, that represents uh, that's hunted with the Waltons. Sam Walton had a saying: it, "It's not what you don't know; it's what you know that ain't so that gets you in trouble." So uh, um, I feel like I've been influenced, and um, my wife. Uh, calls me a quail fanatic and I looked up what fanatic is and Winston Churchill said a fanatic is someone who uh, will not change, cannot change their mind and will not change the subject so uh, I don't know how many of you guys run people off by talking about quail too much but my wife could accuse me of that um, but I have learned a lot and I've learned a lot from some of the mentors here in the room including Dale Rollins, he's a quail influencer but he has not influenced me to change out my pointers for whatever kind of dogs he's running with these days so can i hear an amen for that okay so <laughs> um so with that i want to start off by saying i am speaking for myself he mentioned that i'm part of park city's quail i'm part of quail coalition and i'm also part of rolling plains quail research foundation but i'm up here speaking for myself so those radio people that say the the opinions of this speaker do not necessarily represent the organizations but uh i do think i've had some observations after doing this a few years and i want to share those specifically around uh, creating a community of quail hunters and the importance of quail hunters. If there's one thing I could leave you with is the concept that quail hunters need quail, but quail need quail hunters. Um, I was talking to somebody earlier today. They had a generational change in the ranch. The old man loved quail hunting and the kids don't care about it. They're deer and pig hunters. And he said, you should see what has happened to my ranch since I started managing it for the kids instead of for the dad. So if you don't think quail need quail hunters, go look at a ranch where there's not a quail hunter or there used to be one. It'll break your heart. Um, so this is a picture uh, the end result of some community building. So those may have heard about our dinner that we have in Dallas. Some people call it the Quail Baron's Ball. Uh, it's kind of a big to-do. We raised $2.7 million in uh, this last uh, March. And uh, we've done that pretty well consistently, over a million dollars. In total, we've netted, after all of our expenses, $18.2 million in the last 18 years. So it's pretty impressive. And um, I'm going to tell you how we got there because it, it, it's relative to the to what we're talking about. And that is that um, you got to quail, quail need quail hunters. And what I'll tell you is not everybody in that room owns a bird dog. Not everybody in that room owns a shotgun. There are dormant quail hunters out there who like the idea of quail hunting. They love the coolness of the clothes and the gear and the dogs and the trucks and riding around the ranch. They just don't know how to access it. And so what we set out to do was was get those people together and people that are guests of others and kids and get them enthusiastic about quail hunting. You heard from John uh, McLaughlin a little minute ago about 
the decline in quail hunters. There's some years we only have 30 or 40,000 quail hunters in the state of Texas from a high of 200 something thousand quail hunters. And that's a little scary. So we set out to do that. And I'll go back to the beginning. This is a, this is a painting of my dad. My dad died uh, 20 years ago and he left me a shotgun and I was a dormant quail hunter. I grew up quail hunting, got busy with my career, got busy raising kids and relocating and landed in Texas 23 years ago. And my dad passed. I started thinking about well, the things we used to do together. One of them was quail hunting. And again, he uh, wore the same suit size. So I, I, bar I had his boots and I had his old gun and I started quail hunting in Texas. And it happened to be at the second biggest boom in the last 40 years is 2005 and six. And I just went bonkers. I went out and found 20 cubbies walking uh, with some de mediocre dogs. And I, and I just absolutely flipped out. And I decided uh, I wanted to join the Quail Unlimited chapter. So I looked for it. And there was no Quail Unlimited chapter in Dallas. Hadn't been for years. So the, I got three buddies to sign a um, form to to create a chapter. And it's called Park City's Quail Unlimited. And that was in 2006. We had no idea what we were doing. We started sending emails out. And uh, on the right, you see the committee. That was our committee, entire committee. And that room was uh, the Dallas Country Club. We overflowed. The, and the fire marshal would have shut us down if he'd known how many people were packed in there. But we realized we tapped into some unmet demand and that people really want to want to socialize they want to know other quail hunters and at the table you could hear oh i got a lease there i got a ranch here i need i'm looking for another gun well i've got dogs well i've got a a, a ranch i think i have birds and you could hear the networking starting to take place exactly what we were we were gunning for and um there's an old saying you know better rather be lucky than good um there was a a famous saying from uh from um i'm looking for it here uh from that uh, was a quote uh, from J, J. Paul Getty. So J. Paul Getty said when they asked him what the secret of success was, he said, wake up early, work hard and find oil. So, you know, this, the, the, so <laughs> that's a pretty good formula. So uh, we were working hard and we found oil in the name of T. Boone Pickens. So uh, Boone heard about us. He loved what but he'd had several friends to go to that first dinner and um, he agreed to accept an award playing to his ego, which was considerable and he's a good friend and they uh, rest his soul, but he loved to be, to be talked about. So we talked about him and brought him up and gave him an award. He'd broken his arm that night and he told a funny story the day before he broke his arm and he was on painkillers. So he was really uh, mic'd up and, and off, off script, but he was a lot of fun entertaining and, and uh, when they asked him how he broke his arm, he said, well, I was carrying my wife out of the shower. So it's a typical Boone Pickens story. Um, but his friend Bubba Wood encouraged him to get the award. And we went from making $80,000 that first year, which is a record for Quail Unlimited, to making uh, $650,000 that second year. It happened to be the same year the Rolling Plains Research Ranch had been, it was a year old at that point. So it was just magical. It was just divine providence. And we um, we had already worked out a deal with Quail Unlimited that we were only going to pay them $40,000 max because we knew we were going to make a lot of money. And the experiment was if we if we could leave all the money in Texas beyond a minimum amount, we could raise more money. So we announced that night that our sponsors had covered all of the expenses and every dollar we raised tonight was going to go directly to Texas went to $650,000. So it was awesome. And a lot of people think he gave us a lot of money. He just gave us a hundred at his ranch, which sold for $150,000. But um, he's he was not really a check writer. He was more of a donor of, of his ranch. And it just was a groundswell. So this was our committee the next year, got real popular. And then um, from that, we talked to the other chapters in the state of Texas and said, why are we spending 50% of our money to South Carolina? It's not a migratory bird. Uh, they they spend a lot of their m money on uh, celebrity quail hunts with uh, Barbara Mandrell and little Jimmy Dickens. And I didn't think that helped us very much. So we uh, we agreed to break away from Quail Unlimited. And, and now today's model is that every dollar is raised that's after expenses goes to stays directly in Texas. Actually, it's the chapters. Uh, they're, they're each sovereign. They can each make determinations where the money goes. So they each grants and then they make donations what's right for them so whether it be clayberg 
or rolling plains or tall timbers or uh, quail tech or any number of organizations. So um, we're glad that we've had, we have now you know, 10,000 followers on FaceTime, on uh, social media. We have uh, millions of YouTube view, views. We have uh, been lots of media coverage. It's, it's free media too, which is the best kind. And um, we've raised $30 million, over $30 million this in Texas for quail conservation. So, and education. So we're really thrilled about that. And, you know, success breeds success. So this is our volunteers. This is our committee today. And you can see everybody, at least the ones that show up for the picture. And we have a, a great organization. Jay Stein, who's here, um, is our executive director. We have two employees for the whole state of Texas. So we're very, very efficient and really proud of what we've done. But we've created a community and, and we've gotten some people off the bench and in the game, some dormant quail hunters who grew up with it. And then they rediscovered it or they didn't grow up with it, but they've always heard about it and they rediscovered it. Or they had an uncle or a, or a aunt or a, or a dad who loved it. And then they wanted to see what all the excitement was about. So we've um, also attracted kind of a who's who of, of wildlife conservation and a diverse group of, of hunters and sportsmen with the T. Boone Pickens Lifetime Sportsman Award. It went from Boone Pickens to uh, Ray Sasser, who was a, a, a outdoor writer, Bob Carter, a great hunter, Ray Mursky, a great sportsman, Ted Turner, everybody knows who Ted is, A.V. Jones, who's a, out of Albany, he was a legendary quail hunter, George Strait, some of you have probably heard of George, he did a great job, he played a song and raised a bunch of money. Catherine Armstrong, former Parks and Wildlife um, uh, Chairman, Delmer Smith, the dog trainer, Tom Brokaw, the uh, media guy who loves to hunt, Rick Snipes, who's my partner at the Snipes Ranch, Johnny Morris, the founder of Bass Pro Shop, Carl Allen, who's been a great philanthropist, Bubba Wood, legendary hunter and owner of our gallery, Walter Mattia, and then last year, uh, Kevin Costner. And uh, so we've had a, a really great run of, of really great people who you may not know are hunters, but they are and they have a desire to be. And, and I think you talk about success breeds success. These are people that are eager to go hunting. So Kevin Costner wants to come hunting in Texas, you know, and, and Tom Brokaw wants to go hunting in Texas. And they and they really um, have created a spark and it's attracted more and more folks. Uh, next year, Rex Tillerson, my friend who's a former CEO of Exxon and the Secretary of State for the United States um, is uh, is going to be our honoree. That's breaking news, by the way. We haven't seen the announcement out yet. But it just continues. I think we'll continue to raise a million dollars plus. And a lot of people predicted it was, it was a kind of a flash in the pan, but I, I don't think there's an end to it. But again, dormant hunters, engaged, activated. And I think the same opportunity exists in Houston, uh, in Austin, San Antonio. We've got a great chapter in Midland that's, that's going, uh, Fort Worth. Uh, th these are people that were on the bench, and now they're in the game. And I, and I think the social media is another way to connect them. We, you know, I see some uh, people here that are heavily involved in social media with Texas quail hunters, and I think it's fabulous. Uh, the money just in, in the Park City's case has been spread around pretty well. Uh, to, to several different organizations and done some tremendous work. And I'm here cheering for every one of them. I think uh, there's no competition in this group. The, part of the grant requirements are that you have to share all the information that you have, all your research. You have to be basically open code so that anybody can pick it up and run with it. No proprietary data. Um, and then we're proud, obviously, to those of you that are here yesterday to see the new facility. And you saw the old facility. It was a typical farmhouse with uh, one and a half bed bedrooms. And now it's uh, it's got the ability to host a function, which we're really happy with. And this is not part of that $30 million. These are people who are generous people who saw what we were doing. In addition to the $30 million we've raised, they wrote some checks directly to Roman Plains. So it's just a, it's just a snowball effect and it's, and it's fantastic. So back to the community message, quail need quail hunters. And, uh, and so we're creating those kind of communities. Um, one community I want to point out that's kind of a, I guess an idol of mine is if you've ever been to the, who, who here's hunted the Red Hills of North Florida or South Georgia? Alabama, a few. So if you ever go there, you realize there's a whole culture. It's kind of like the horse culture in Louisville, Kentucky, around the, or the Kentucky Derby, or Augusta, you know, for golf. Um, 
each one of those dots represents or places represents an individual ranch or excuse me ranch i gotta change the language in the southeast farm plantation and the plantations are individual quail plantations a lot of them are single purpose they only exist for quail they don't they don't farm it they don't timber they don't cut timber unless it's helpful to quail and the prices there reflect that kind of desire people from all over the country love to go quail hunting and they've done a great job of developing a reputation so um the land prices are up the 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 hotels and the restaurants and the the guides and the dog providers and the trainers and everybody benefits because they've created a culture of the capital for quail hunting in North Florida and Georgia. And you see Alabama in the one corner and, and uh, the, the central Georgia in one. And I think about places like Stuttgart, Arkansas. Uh, you know, they could self-proclaimed duck hunting capital of the world. And um, I think about uh, South Dakota, who's done a great job of harboring tourists, you know, bring, encouraging tourists. They'd spend state dollars to advertise, come to South Dakota and hunt pheasants. And I think you know, when I think about wild quail, I think about South Texas. I think about West Texas. I think about uh, George, the Red Hills District of Florida and Georgia. And, and I know we had that kind of opportunity to, to benefit all these small towns. When you drive through a small town that's just had the wind knocked out of it and you see three abandoned gas stations and closed storefronts. And, you know, one time you see an old welcome hunter's hand sign that's just dangling down that's that's been beat up. And you know that uh, there's an industry there and we just got to do a better job of, of bringing new people into the sport. I'll talk about a few things that I think are challenges. Obviously, loss of habitat. I don't need to cover that. Aging hunters. Our, uh, when I sit around with a lot of the hunters, there's a lot of us that are 60 plus, and we got to do a better job of bringing young people in. Uh, lack of public land. Four percent of Texas is is public, and uh, then expensive ranches and dogs and gear. It is expensive. It's it's no question about it. It's an expensive sport. But I remind my friends who who don't get any meat. Who I like to fly fish sometimes, and they'll go to Canada and catch a bunch of fish and release them all. So it's still more expensive to catch a fish and release it than it is to catch a quail and eat it. So um, the loss of outfitters, when I first got turned on to quail hunting, you could pay somebody 500 bucks and they meet you at the at the cafe and take you out hunting. And then you could experience it like you were the landowner. And, the, and with the loss of quail or the dip in quail, it's, it's kind of collapsed that whole outfitter business, at least in West Tennessee, West Texas. I'm not that familiar with many people that have the, the ability to, to do an outfitting trip. And then lack of government support. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. It's not, you know, quail hunters kind of are self-sufficient. They take care of their own needs and take care of themselves. But we all need a little help. And with the decline in quail and quail hunting, we need to work on that. But the number one challenge is lack of quail. And what else, if you saw the correlation between those lines that John McLaughlin showed, the quail abundance and quail hunters, it's a direct correlation. Those lines followed each other. And so some people have talked about we need to put a limit on quail. Well, two things wrong with that. One thing is quail hunters self-regulate. You don't hunt if there are no birds. I mean, I, I'll tell my I got married uh, eight years ago and it was one of the boom years. And I said, honey, you're not going to believe this, but this is one of those years. I'm going to go hunt 25 days. I'm just going to do it. And it's not going to be like this. And I had to get all these witnesses to tell her, it's true. This is going to be a good year. And that was uh, 15. And then the down year, and I might hunt five or six days because, I'm, you know, first of all, it's fruitless. And secondly, you don't want to hammer what you got there. You want to create the, some carryover birds. But the more quail, the more quail hunting. And you've seen the spikes that go with the spike in birds. So if we can solve that or at least do what we can to, to, to increase the population, huntable population, we will have more bird hunters. It's just, it's just the way it works. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that really hit me hard was a story um, by Tom Davis in, in Sporting Classics, and he said it, it called the loss of quail our greatest wildlife tragedy in America. And it's true when you look at the numbers, um, and he used the term recreational extinct in parts of the country. And where I came from, they are recreationally extinct. You might hear one every now and then, but in West Tennessee, where the field trials are for Ames Plantation, where I grew up, uh, they, they, there's no huntable population. And you start looking at some of the headlines that were going on in, when we started the, the community of quail hunters. You know, flight risk uh, in the Dallas Morning News, puzzling decline. It's time for solutions for dwindling quail. This is all going on in 2000. 
you know, 16, 15, and, uh, and then can anyone save the Bob White? So here's my take on this is Joe Crafton's take on it. it. Habitat and favorable weather are foundational. So you heard all the speakers, and I agree 100% with them, that habitat is foundational. It's like sports. You have to have great athletes. You can't, you can't take bad athletes and make a great team. So you have to have good habitat. You have to have favorable weather. And then there's this all other, this other in the sports analogy, you'd say you have to have healthy athletes. If your star quarterback gets hurt, if you don't have good weight training, if you don't have good uh, – you know, conditioning, you could have a bad season. So I'm not, I don't want anybody to think I'm a zealot that, that I'm only concentrating on the other. I love, I really spend a lot of time and money on habitat and I pray for the weather, but I can only affect the other. I can't, can't affect the other two, at least at our place. So there's a, right about that same time in 2012, we started thinking about, um, disease. And so the board of Rolling Plains Square Research Foundation decided to spend $2 million, which is basically the whole treasury, to find out what is that other, what is that X factor that influences um, the thing that we can control, which might be disease. And it, it's prevalent in other species. The the red grouse in Scotland uh, had a pr terrible parasite problem, and they've started putting medicated feed, penbenzol, in their grit, and they knocked the bottom out of that cycle. Every five years, they had this huge cycle, and they figured out it's finally because of a parasite infection. And so now they put medicated feed in their grit. Well, here's the kind of projects that, oh, that Operation, Indi Operation Idiopathic Decline which is what Dale Rollins called it, we funded. And you can see that everything from avian influenza to West Nile disease, coccyliosis, uh, aflatoxins, all kinds of things that we, we funded. And the prime suspect came back as a parasite. You mentioned you heard earlier that in South Texas, the, they did necropsies on all these birds and some found zero parasites. Well, that's not the case here in, uh, in West Texas, in the Roland Plains. Um, so you saw certain the news, the, the news changing, the search for the smoking gun, parasites are a prime suspect. This is a picture I took that's pretty well published all over the place, but I could give you a hundred of these and I hate to do this right after lunch, but I hope nobody had the linguine, but it, we, uh, this is a close up picture. Now I've been hunting birds a long time. I've re until recently, I start never looked at their eye. You've heard never look a gift horse in the mouth. Well, when was the last time you shot a bird? You got excited. Hey, give me that bird. Let me look in his eye. It's not, it's not a typical thing. You put it in your vest and you keep going. And so I learned about this and I started looking and, and at our ranch, it was 70% of the birds that I tested and I field tested them. Like I'll show you a video here in a second. Um, they had worms in their eye that you were visible. They, a lot of them live behind the eye and they even live in the ducts in their tear ducts and so forth. So do a proper ne necropsy will, will really tell you the tale. But if you just do a field inspection, which I'll show you a video here, you can see it's a 70% correlation. So you take 10 birds in the bag, you check them out, you have, you have say, five of them have eye worms. Guess what? Your ranch has eye worms. And if you uh, take sample enough of them, you'll know if you have them or not. You don't have to send them to the lab if you sample enough of them. So 70% of the time that a necropsy proves it, you could have proved it by doing a field inspection, if that makes sense. Um, this is one bird, and this is the birds, to give you a relative measure, those on the right, those on the right are actually sequel worms. They're in the cecum, and the average worm, I'll show you a chart here in a second, uh, so they rob them of nutrition in the stomach because they're competing with, with the nutrition. And then the one with the nickel there for perspective is, is, is in the eye. And so well, they found none in South Texas. They found a lot here. Here's a video of me doing it. That's my, those are my knuckles there. And this is the inspection method. You squeeze on the side of their eye like you're popping something and then watch what comes out. Look at that. So that's Pete Delkins filming that, and that's me doing it to one of our birds. And that's not an uncommon sight uh, in the Rolling Plains. And it, but again, you have to do, you have to actually pick them up, and I'll let them cool off for an hour or two, and then do it because then the worms kind of realize the host is dead, and they seem to be easier to find. But there's a nick and neat nick and <laughs> say it for me. 
nic, nic, nicotine, it's not nicotine, it's nic, nic, something membrane. Uh, this is the second eyelid. And if you push on that, a lot of times they're underneath there. And if you pull the eye out, which I don't recommend, uh, they're even more. So um, it's, uh, it is a uh, issue, and I'll show you the prevalence here. This is a study done by uh, Dr. Brad Kabetska and, um, and uh, Becky Rizuka. It was done for uh, Parks and Wildlife. I physically, I personally paid for the technicians to do the necropsies on this because because we didn't have the budget, but I, I cared that much about it. And the results said that between 2017 and 22, 1,800 samples were submitted, necropsies, and examined for eyeworms. Across the samples that were received, 69% of them had an average of 14 worms. Excuse me, an intensity of 21 worms. The ones that they did have worms had 21 of them on average. Here are the counties. Can you see that? Those are the counties. So it's pretty widespread. This is not a single county. This is the cost of rolling plains. You know, 60, 80, 90 percent infection rates. The Stonewall County, where my ranch is, had 44 average of 44 eyeworms per bird. We, sub we submitted 15 samples and the average bird had 44 worms in their eyes. <clears throat> and so it goes on. You can see the numbers. It's, it's shocking. Now, this is a pandemic and it's a regional pandemic. And people say, well, you know, back in the 1950s, they discovered them. Yes, they did. They discovered them. They published it. And then nobody did anything with it. No, no criticism. It's just there was there's no follow on study about what it, what the effects are or whether it could be prevented. So they've, they've always been in the background, but for whatever reason, and you heard Dr. Fernandez earlier talk about the soil microbes. We, we don't we don't understand why that we have them where we do. We just know we have them in the rolling plains. And then sequel worms, this is an interesting chart. You can see that, that across the spectrum, um, they had an average of... Uh, of, of two, uh, the sequel worms at the Rolling Plains Research Ranch, where you visited yesterday, had an average of 410 worms in their stomach, in their cecum, which again, robs them of nutrition, could cause other other medical issues, but it's, it's widely held across the, the Rolling Plains. So, pivoting a little bit, going to talk about uh, quail guard, because I, I, I anticipate a lot of questions. I've had a lot of people ask me about this. So, it's an 11-year project following idiopathic decline uh, Rolling Plains and Park Seas Quail has been paying uh, for this research. We've spent $4 million to date. Uh, about half of it came from Park Seas Quail and half of it came from Rolling Plains. And of course, most of the Rolling Plains came from Park Seas Quail. So you can say that that's where a lot of the money went. Uh, Dr. Kendall, who's Texas Tech Wildlife Toxicology Lab, and he's very accomplished, very accredited, very um, recognized expert on wildlife toxicology. And he has been working with the Food and Drug Administration to get an, a, an approved Medicaid feed for wild quail. Um, the active ingredient is fenvendazole. Um, it's widely used in chicken chicken operations, turkey operations, uh, beef. And so it is an active ingredient. It's not something that is new to the world. It's been it's heavily used and proven. It's passed all its final testing and approvals of April of this year. They said you're it's kind of like you graduated, but they haven't handed you the diploma yet. So they've said well, you're done. You all the testing's complete. There were no complaint there were no pushbacks from other other uh, scientists. But um, we are still waiting on Merck, who owns the patent for Fenbendazole, to give us the label description that will go on the labels of, of Quail Guard. So we anticipate that it'll be ready um, in the spring. We're hopeful, and we've been saying this now for four or five years. But, but Bryant Mills in Alito, Texas, is going to be producing it for us. They have 180 people uh, feed stores that sell their feed across the Rolling Plains. It's a palatable formation that's been tested and tested and reformulated to make sure the quail will eat it. It contains elements that help the, the immunity. It has vitamins in it. And the royalties, this is one of the best parts of it, the royalties are going to come, 62% is going to come to Park City's quail, who will then again spend it on more research. And then uh, a third of it will go to uh, Dr. Kendall, uh, which he will probably use to spend some research as well. But but it's not going to Merck or, or any Monsanto. It's going to, the royalties are going to come to us. It is historical. It's the first medicated treat for a wild bird in the U.S. in the natural habitat. 
And the only other drug that's ever been approved for a wild animal in the U.S. is a bighorn sheep. So that's pretty amazing when you think about it. People say, why does it take so long? Well, we didn't know. We really didn't know how long it was going to take it. Apparently, it takes a lot longer. It's a lot more expensive than anybody knew. So if quail safe people are here, we have no arrange with them other than they are going to be that's going to be the recommended uh, feeder that was tested and, and approved by the FDA and it's going to cost around 1250 bucks and a piece but there's bulk discounts available if you order a bunch of them we ordered them in Mother Snipes Ranch and so we were part of the three ranches that they tested this Fenbendazole treatment on and Snipes Ranch is located in As Vermont about an hour and 15 minutes north of here uh, Rick Snipes is the, the been for 30 years he's been grooming his ranch it's a single purpose ranch it only exists for quail we don't care about cattle or, or wind or hay or anything with quail 6,000 acres this is where the feeders are located on our place so we have really good coverage it's uh it's 60 feeders about a seventy thousand dollar investment um but those things are built like a sherman tank you can i think they'll last for decades um we do it two cycles a year. We put a bag in each feeder in in October, so thereabouts when the grasshoppers go to start going away. And then again in May, we put a bag in each feeder. And the rest of the time, you can use milo and wheat or whatever. And then it costs about ten thousand dollars a year for our six thousand acre ranch to do this treatment. It's not a year round treatment. It's a you, and it doesn't prevent uh, parasites. It just kills them and cleans them up, and then they'll. They may contract them again, but they won't be loaded with parasites the way the other. And so I'm coming down the home stretch here. Um, so we had 100% infection and in, in, in an intensity of 44 bur uh, worms per eye. It dropped to 70%. This is me doing the test in the field in 2020. And then we had 20, about a 25% infection rate last year. But the intensity was a lot lower. We went from 44 um, in the necropsy in the eyes to 7 which probably means they cleaned them up. But by the time I shot them, uh, they'd gotten a few more. Uh, so we trapped 20 birds uh, in, in that with the um, and used the the mobile testing lab. We now have the DNA of the worm. We can swab the bird, not have to sacrifice the bird, and determine whether they have eye worms or not. So they did that recently, and we had no eye worms, and we only found four sequel. But we only found four of the 20 birds had had sickle worms. Uh, we averaged about three cubbies an hour last year for the Roland Plains. That's the last two years. And that's pretty, pretty good. One last thing I want to point out, and this is kind of a project I've been on for a while. We all pay to hunt upland, okay? Parks and Wildlife has an upland game bird fee. It's either part of your super combo or it's a fee that you pay $7 for. And it brings in about a million five a year. So $1.5 million a year from all of the upland stamps that are sold. And so earlier, John McLaughlin talked about the $1.5 million that's been spent on research by Parks and Wildlife since 2018. And I'll tell you, you know, from my, from a quail hunter's perspective, Joe Craft and not any other organization, um, you know, this next year, they're going to spend about $150,000 in the budget for research out of $1.5 million collected. And there was a period of time a few years ago when the Parks and Wildlife went through a, a bit of a budget crisis and some of the money was used to supplement um, staff positions in order to have not to have to term, make, have massive layoffs. And that money is still being used that way largely. 70% of the budget goes to supplement salaries as opposed to resource. So one of my wishes is, and I'll let them defend themselves, um, is that we'll, for next year, instead of spending $157,000 of the $1.5 million that comes in on the research projects, that they would spend a lot more on research. So the last thing, this is my last slide. So First of all, need, I think, can, quail stamp money needs to be used for research organizations. Uh, secondly, there's a, we need a study to test and quantify the research on a landscape scale. It's one thing to say it proved in a lab. It's one thing to say it proved out on three ranches, but it's anecdotal, and we need a really comprehensive study to, to confirm all that. Uh, we need guidance on the practical use of the medicated feed for ranchers and quail hunters. Where's the economic sweet spot where it makes sense to do it? And then regular monitoring, monitoring for diseases. You know, we're spending our money that's raised by selling raffle tickets and chicken dinners to go out and figure out whether we have parasites or not. It'd be nice if there was a statewide monitoring service so if we knew we had a pandemic somewhere. 
And then lastly, uh, more engagement and quail specific training for parks and wildlife uh, field personnel. I know there are a lot of parks and wildlife people here. I've talked to several people who said, I, just, I just wish our field agents could advise our ranchers more on what to do to benefit quail. It's still a very deer centric state. And I get it. There's millions of deer hunters. There's only few hundred, few, uh, you know, 50, 60,000 quail hunters, but uh, the field agents could really help our ranchers. And maybe we have a symposium like this and try to train as many people as we can on best practices. So that's all I have. I appreciate the time and uh, I'm around for questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, haven't had the opportunity to meet everyone here today, but my name is John Solosky. I'm Wildlife Division Director, Texas Parks and Wildlife, and you're going to be uh, trying to help us through these next couple uh, conversations we're going to have with a panel discussion on a variety of topics. Uh, uh, as Dale mentioned this morning on his uh, comments, you know, we really look for uh, audience participation, and so we hope that the message that some of these folks will share with you will stimulate some questions and uh, we'll uh, have a good discussion this afternoon. So our first group of speakers are going to talk about quail manage management for landowners and managers perspective and what those decisions mean to them. We have four special guests that will be uh, uh, part of this conversation. And if those folks will start making their way up here to the stage, I'll introduce them right before they get ready to talk. So we have Jerry, Bob, Daniel, Celeste, Lacey, Josh Sparks, and Jesse Wood that will be participating in this panel. And so these folks, like I said, are going to discuss the benefits and challenges associated with quail focused managed practices on private lands in Texas, how they prioritize those management strategies while considering the holistic management of that particular property. And then part of that conversation I expect will be uh, what kind of conflicts these decisions can create from an economic standpoint and just a business decision point for them. So, uh, as I said, Jerry Bob is going to be our first speaker uh, this afternoon. Jerry is the co-founder of the Circle Bar Ranch, which is located in northern Knox County. He and his bride uh, built the, started building this ranch in 1981. Uh, the Daniels have uh, put together about 29,000 contiguous acres over that period of time and, and purchased that from 35 separate properties. Uh, Jerry Bob is also director of the Pitchfork Land and Cattle, Cattle Company, which is also a family operation located in King and Dickens County. And that ranch has been in the family since 1883. So Jerry, you ready to get us started? How'd you get me into this, Dale? <laughs> you know, I wanted to ask first thing, is anybody uh, carrying a weapon? Because I'm, I'm hoping I'm not the only guy that runs cattle here. Uh, Dale invited me to, to you run cattle good, stay close to me. Uh, we were in Aspermont, what, 25 years ago? Doing something, I believe? 2002, okay. I was close. And uh, I gave a couple of uh, comments. I think Dale still quotes me on one of them. We, uh, I told him that, uh, you know, well, first let me start back. In, in 81, I was 22 years old. I married this woman from New York. 
and we started uh, we started talking about doing what we're going to do with our plans. And I said, well, I'd like to manage ranches. That's what I've been interested in. My dad managed some smaller ranches in Knox and Ford County for all of his life. And he started out at 21 years, and I started out at 22 years old managing a ranch. And uh, she said, well, I'd rather own a ranch. I said, well, good luck. I don't have any money. She said, well, I'll do. We'll work together on this. So we started out in 1981 uh, leasing ranches. I think I met you in 1983, Dale, on that one of those Y Ranch. You were doing a survey up there. We ended up leasing that property that year. And within two years of marriage, we'd leased 100,000 acres in four counties. And I didn't have sense enough to know better because we were paying 18% interest on the money. Figure that one out. Well, we had to pretty fast. But we we went on a journey probably our first 10 years. I always said, I'm writing a book right now, Dale, you're in it. I'm almost finished with it. But the first 10 years, we didn't make a dime, but we didn't lose any money. But I sure learned a whole lot of things. You know, in 81, uh, Mr. Burgess wanted to lease that ranch up there, and so we started leasing it. We got a dollar an acre for it. You wanted quail, deer, whatever. And uh, from that, I learned a whole lot. Uh, Ken Miller, I don't know if you knew a biologist from Amarillo. I only met him one time, but I started purchasing land in, in 1990. And uh, I asked Lynn to come down because of you. And, and some of the talks I'd seen you give at the cattle raisers uh, meetings about land use and what you need to do with property and be careful what you do to it. Because I had witnessed my father married and my mother when they were 16 years old. And he was doing, you know, yesterday when we made that first stop, little terrace or berm, you had the road. My dad was doing that in the 60s. And he just learned from hard work and not a lot of education, just common sense. And if you don't get anything from my message today, you common sense will get you through a lot of things. But anyways, we started buying land in 1990 because we saw an opportunity. Up to that point, we'd only been leasing property. We had no deer. We, were, we had cattle and wheat was our income. There was no wildlife income to speak of because most of the ranches that we were leasing, they were getting all the income. So I started buying property because interest rates were cheap. Land was cheap. You're talking about land values back then? I bought a property in 1995 for $75 an acre. And nine years later, I sold it for 350 and it just kept going up. Probably just kept going up. Luckily, I was in an area that I grew up in and knew all the landowners. 70% of the properties, you know, it was 29,000 acres we bought over a period of since 18, 1985 till last year. And it's all contiguous. Out of 35 different properties, and we'd get 75 different signatures to get all that done. So it took a while to do that, but I never thought that we would make it contiguous like we did because I was afraid Hunter was going to buy it all. And remember what I said in, in that astronaut meeting? Do you want to buy the land and lease it to the hunters, or do you want to let them buy it and you lease the grazing from them? So I had my mind made up that I wanted to buy it and be in charge of what was the destiny was for myself and my family. Well, I haven't shot a bird since 2018. That was the last good year I remember, but it was a good one. We went out, and matter of fact, I, we leased our hunting that year to some, some guides and hunters. The least cubbies we got up one day was 21, and the most I got one day was 39. It was a great year. But I don't know what happened after that. Maybe you folks can educate me on that. But what, what, what have I done to help quail? You know, it was talked a little bit earlier uh, today about uh, fragmentation of property. Well, we put 29,000 contiguous acres together. Now, you say cattle can't run with quail. I'm going to believe that they can. Because in the 60s and 70s, 
I promise you, we've got more grass than they had back then. We manage better, and we have a lot fewer quail today. And so there's something else wrong. I think there's something else that accompanies that. This morning we heard about rainfall. We've got about 5% 5, 5 that we feel like we can have control of, rain control the rest of it. There was a lady by the name of Helen Browning Garris. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of her or not. She's passed away. She had cancer about eight or 10 years ago and passed away. She came to the cattle raiders meeting in 1991. She was a climatologist, and I think she was out of Denver, Colorado. And she gave the best meetings about the climate. And she told me something I'll never forget. She said, global warming. She said, let me tell you about the climate. We run in trends that go over about 20 to 30, sometimes 50 year trends. These aren't these little five year trends they keep talking about. This dry period, we had a wet period from the 60s into the 90s, wetter period. We're gonna, and she was talking about this in 1992. We're about to enter a dry period. Then came the bad news. It's gonna last about 30 years, maybe 40. We're in that right now. That's what, that's what she predicted. And I never forgot that. So careful about thinking that we really control what's going on too much out there, but I think we have a lot to do with what, on the small things that we can do. Fragmentation of land. Now we live in Northern Knox County, which is about hundred miles due north of here. And we're very fortunate because my east is the Wagner Ranch. 540,000 acres. Then you run into a little 15,000 acre of broken land around the Gillen community. And then you run into our ranch. North of us is the Halsell Ranch, about 40,000. Spot Box to the south, about 88,000. Masterson's west of us, another 80,000. Ross, Sixes, Pitchfork. So we have a large area of of ranch land, and someone was talking earlier about 300,000 acres, maybe affecting the genetics of the quail. We have a pretty good little area right there, I think, from that regard, and it's not being broken up. So maybe that's a little something that we're contributing to. Maybe not overgrazing is helping. And uh, and I just when we lease now. We have to look at what we lease our property for, what we get out of our property. In 1998 or, or 2002, 90% of our income came from wheat and cattle. And this is your quote. 10% came from hunting. 70% of our profit came from that 10% of hunting. That was the quote. Today it hasn't changed much except our, our gross revenue has gone up considerably with cattle because we have cattle, we have horses, we have some recreational value and other things, so it's more like 60, 40 now. But hunting still contributes a great deal of the profit. So many people won't look at the profit, they say, oh, I'm making $2 million on this property. No, you're not, you might make 50,000 out of that 2 million. Pitchfork Ranch. They leased their property for 21 years to a hunting guide who retired about four years ago. We collected $11 million out of that 21 years. Most of that went out toward expenses. The ranch got very little of it because my father-in-law, bless his soul, he passed away two years ago. He said, he's from New York. He said, we're not leasing that ranch. The family needs to keep using it. Well, other part of the family run out and we leased the ranch. And they had a pretty good run on quail for a while. But our big revenue source was deer hunting and people that simply want to get out of the city and just have a place to go to. And so that's what we lease today. Now, for, regarding the quail, every segment of our resources, which is horses, cattle, Hunting, and hunting breaks down into dove, deer, turkey, quail. 
I've about conquered everything to get it going on all cards except quail. It's been the tough one. But if you'll read on that page that I wrote in there, on 22, I put in there right in the middle of it, it said, as each decade progressed, my wife and I evolved with the period and implemented decisions which benefited the bottom line, but never at the cost of one resource segment over the other. And that's the quail. We don't overgraze, Dale. And I, th I think that that's important. And we do have quail, but I don't believe we have enough to hunt. It doesn't satisfy me anyway. Anyways, I'm gonna leave that. Uh, I like questions, so get some questions. And I'm gonna turn it back over. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that, Mr. Daniel. Very interesting story there. Lots of good experiences to draw from. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Celeste Lacey. She is the ranch manager for the Southern M Ranch located in Purcell, Texas. She began with the Southern M in 2015 as a part-time uh, uh, hunting guide and while working as a Creasel Spring High School Ag Science teacher and future Farmers America advisor. She's originally from East Texas, Celeste calls South Texas home now since 2010. She's also a member of the Texas Wildlife Association and a recent graduate of the 2022 Quail Masters class. So. Thank you for that introduction. And I'd like to thank Dana and uh, Dr. Rollins for asking me to be a part of this panel. It's always uh, nice to see everybody. And uh, I'm gonna quote him with saying that uh, we're standing on the shoulders of giants and everybody out here in this audience is a giant in some aspect. So thank you all for being out here. Um, as uh, my, what is your name? John. As John introduced me, I am uh, started out in deer mainly and have recently in the past couple of years kind of switched over to um, more of a quail management aspect. Um, if you'd ask me, so ironically, about 20 or so years ago, when I was in high school, I attended one of the first Bob White brigades. My father was friends with Scotty Parsons, and he said, hey, your daughter needs to attend this. So if there was ever a foreshadowing in my life, maybe that was the, the point. Um, Southern M Ranch is located in uh, South Texas brush country in Frio County and uh, in Pearsall, Texas. And Frio County and the surrounding counties generate a sizable revenue every year for hunting, whether it be quail, deer, dove, turkeys. Um, there's a lot of revenue that comes into those counties. so. We need to make it a priority to promote hunting and quail habitat and conservation. Um, we are not a commercial hunting ranch. Uh, our focus is to continue to provide suitable habitat. My goal is to provide a great hunting experience for our guests and to use each opportunity each weekend they come out to maybe talk a little about about conservation and habitat management and the importance of that and get the future generations uh, involved. Uh, that's job security for me. Uh, as long as I can keep my landowners invested, then I feel like we, we all have a job. Uh, Southern M Ranch is ap approximately 5,000 acres, roughly divided into five unequal pastures. Uh, the surrounding areas are medium to large size ranches and a lot of farmland. So in our particular area, we're kind of a um, little oasis um, as opposed to the surrounding uh, where it's nothing but farmland. And we have some unique topographic features that um, lay into different soil profiles and in, a, in good years and when we have good rainfall, it can yield to a very diverse plant community. So, which leads to great conditions for quail. Um, for habitat management, uh, which I feel like is one of the key things, um, some things to think about when you're thinking about your property and how you might manage it. Uh, think about your goals and objectives. Are they realistic to your property? 
Um, I mean, you may want to do one thing that's working in West Texas, but in South Texas, it's not going to be good. Uh, take Dr. Dale's advice. Think like a quail. Really get on their level. And that's from where you're putting your feeders, uh, where you're putting your watering holes, how you're rearranging things like that really get on their level and you take a different perspective when you think how that animal um, thinks and how they go about their daily life um, mr ricky and mr ken in the back uh, know your plants and how to manipulate them and uh, it's uh, i'm a little hypocritical because i did really bad on the plant quiz earlier but um definitely no know uh, you know what what kind of food that the quail eat and what kind of plants to look for what to keep what you might want to take care of uh, and then also when you're going about habitat management ask yourself are you doing it for the good of the quail or are you doing it for ease of hunting and sometimes those things can overlap but I feel like uh, this is our land manager's perspective. The most important priority is your habitat and creating that for the quail. So some of the management techniques that we use um, to continue to provide sustainable habitat is prescribed fire. Uh, last year we did not get to, we burn about 10 to 15 percent of um, our acres and um, usually we try to prescribe we try to burn about 40 percent that seems to work for us and so it's kind of a if then if we see a lot of fuel in places that we need to burn then we'll try to burn um, you also have to be a planner when you're doing things like that we ran into we got a new judge last year and we're in an arid environment so we constantly are under a burn ban well, the new judge required, usually used to, we could call in, hey, I'm going to burn, call the sheriff's department. Um, you're good. You can burn any time in the next couple of weeks. So the new judge required about four or five different pages to fill out and wanted the fire marshal to come out and look at your place first. And then you only had a three-day window. So anybody that lives in South Texas knows that the wind blows 15 to 20 miles an hour most days. So you, you have to really plan ahead and, and be ready to, to burn. Um, we also uh, started mulching and creating those mots that Dr. Dale was talking about in softball size range and have really seen some we took some uh, drone photos and it's it looks really good um, but you really also want to and i'm going to go over this in a minute but uh, keep records of what you do um, we take photos we have photo sites that we take um, pictures of every year or twice a year and you know write down what you planted what worked what you did here uh, and then go back and reflect on those types of things and so that's really helped us we do do some ipt uh, brush species and then um, a couple of years ago we acquired 900 acres across the county road which had been historically groomed for quail so we kind of got the keys to the castle it, it had been grazed we let it rest for two years and in january we put um, 38 head of cows on there so it's continuous grazing with light stocking now we got a little rain in april and may and i thought oh man that buffalo grass is going to blow up if we're going to keep getting rain so i had a little thought about maybe i should put some more cattle on there Thank God that was a little thought, and I didn't, because we didn't get any rain. So um, just kind of, you know, take it easy on what you do. Don't go full force all the time. Um, and understand that habitat management is a process. Uh, some practices may take years to see your results. And then some mess-ups may take years to fix. So um, kind of plan accordingly. Um, another uh, management perspective, get to know your property, like I said, uh, and get to know your neighbors. Uh, most of the neighbors, like I said, they're medium to large ranches. We call each other once or twice a month. Hey, how many quail are you seeing? How much rain did you get? Things like that. It helps you kind of know what's going on around you. 
And a lot of times if, you know, my neighbor or I said, hey, I just saw um, some young birds. Well, we're going to alter our uh, hunting schedule due to that. So last year we had, there was a third hatch. And so we didn't end up hunting till late January, early February. And we kind of pushed that back. Um, take advantage of the programs in your area. Uh, your information resources, NRCS, TPWD, AgriLife. AgriLife is really good for any chemicals that you're using. I mean, they have a whole library. It, it, sometimes it takes a minute to get acquainted with those, but um, there's plenty of people to help and uh, be teachable and open to new ideas. And uh, Quail Masters really open our eyes to that. Uh, last year, my boss and myself completed Quail Masters. And for him, uh, it was really good for him to see that habitat management is a process and it's not, you won't get results right away. Uh, my silver bullet was people's minds are changed uh, through observation and not through argument. And so a couple years ago, he decided he wanted to get rid of 60% of the cactus because he was tired of walking through cactus. And I'm sorry, Ryan, but um, after putting out dummy nests through uh, quail masters and seeing the success of the cactus, he realized how vital cactus is to our area. So that was, that was nice. Um, but uh, anyway, I look forward to your questions and it's been a a great time being a ranch manager. It's it's something that's changing all the time and you have to be open to change and I thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Celeste. So next speaker then uh, to share with us will be Josh Sparks and Josh is the ranch manager of the 45,000 acre Jones Ranch Alto Colorado division in Brooks County. Two primary management practices they utilize on that property are grazing and prescribed fire, much like we've heard about already. Uh, and the goal of those management practices is to maximize habitat for quail as well as deer. So Josh. How's everybody doing? My, uh, my name is Josh Sparks. I manage 45,000 acres in Brooks County, Texas on the Jones Ranch, Alto Colorado division. And uh, everything we do is with quail in mind. Every decision that's made is for the quail's benefit. Um, our two big practices that we use in managing habitat is prescribed fire with rotational grazing. We, uh, we do do some brush work here, here and there, but when you're managing that amount of ground, it's the thing that I am struck with and challenged with is trying to be efficient and feasible when you look at trying to manage on that landscape at that scale. So what we have implemented is we burn roughly 15 to 20%. We have eight major pastures and we burn 15 to 20% in each one of those pastures on a four year rotation. And when I started in 2016, we were pretty overgrazed. We were short in a lot of our country. So we completely destocked every pasture and let them rest for two or three years. And then we started to reintroduce cattle. But what has happened since then is we have a, a grass down there. It's Tanglehead. I don't know if anybody in here is familiar with it, but it's a warm season. And when it grows, I mean, it grows. In spots, it's not bad, but it'll turn into a monoculture and nothing can use it. So what uh, the East Foundation has done a lot of research on and what we're implementing and having good results with is burning that country and growing cattle on it the day you burn it and stocking it relatively heavier than what you would stock what we would stock some of our other country um, and we've had great results with it so far but when you look at back to being feasible you know if you're going to drive like disc strips are very popular when you look at trying to manage eight 5,000 acre pastures and you're pulling a 10 to 12 foot disc, I, I was talking to a buddy last night and we did the math. 
for 10 miles, you roughly do 14 acres. And when you look at a 5,000 acre pasture scale, you're really not doing much in the grand scheme of things. But if you can burn that country and graze it, you're generating the same type of soil response. Those cattle get in there, and then, like Dr. Rollins says, those cattle will find that black country and they will eat it and turn that soil over and promote kind of the mosaic landscape of different types of successional habitat. And we've had really good luck with it. And we're very blessed where we're at in South Texas. In good years, it's great. In bad years, it's still not as bad as a lot of other places. Um, but what I've noticed from us implementing these type of management plans with burning and grazing and doing all the things that we're doing are the good years are really good and the bad years aren't so bad. I would say on average, we hunt typically Friday through Sunday and we're running five trucks a day. And between those five trucks, we're probably moving anywhere from 75 to 100 coveys a day. So what we're doing, I have faith in. And if things can pan out and we can get a little rain, things are looking good. So. Thank you, Josh. That sounds like a lot of quail. You guys should be happy. So, so the last speaker for this panel is Mr. Jesse Wood. And Jesse is the ConocoPhillips Permian Basin Director of Ecology and Sustainable Development. In this role, Jesse oversees stewardship activities and management of natural resources on more than 195,000 acres in the Permian Basin of Texas and New Mexico. He also serves as the liaison to state and federal agencies addressing threatened and endangered species. Lots of challenges associated with that. Um, species and concerns facilitating implementation of corporate sustainable development and biodiversity initiatives. Uh, in a previous life, Jesse also has a few years working for the NRCS and uh, he's going to share his ideas on managing some of that Permian Basin country. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and uh, see a bunch of folks I hadn't seen in a long time. So uh, always a, a great opportunity to come to these events. Um, a couple of folks earlier mentioned uh, energy development. I think uh, John McLaughlin mentioned it. Uh, Dr. Hernandez mentioned it as well. Uh, I believe on the map, I can't remember if it was Dr. Rollins uh, in the first session, showed a map with where everybody was from. There was one little dot in Midland. I think that was me. I'm not sure if there's any, any other folks here or not. If you hadn't been there, come for the scenery. It's, it's beautiful, especially right now. But uh, but no, there's there's a lot of special things about the Permian Basin. There's a lot of challenges as well. Uh, obviously, my angle is from a, a, you know energy development standpoint. Uh, right now, in the Permian Basin, the oil field is is blowing and going uh, like it like it does. Uh, you know, it's up and down. It's definitely up now. Uh, a couple of things that are that are well fairly recent developments is uh, the uh, renewable energy development, low carbon initiatives, low carbon projects. If, if you've heard anything from oil and gas companies, there's a, a lot of um, uh, influence from investors, potentially uh, from folks that are not intimately familiar with the energy industry. There's a lot of uh, impetus on um, implementing low carbon practices uh, to, to meet um, initiatives that have been, have been set at the corporate level. Uh, just to set the stage a little bit, uh, John mentioned we have just under 200,000 acres in the Permian Basin. A lot of that is situated in Upton County, uh, just south of Midland, Odessa. And we have a fair chunk of ground in southeast uh, New Mexico in Lee County, um, and then up around Artesia as well. So it's a pretty broad range of, of habitats uh, and uh, uh, ecosystems there. The challenges that, that we have, or that the, the requests that we field regarding renewable energy uh, present a, a new set of challenges for us. 
um, from the outset, what we did starting back about 2017 is start building conservation plans for these properties. Uh, we started with a blank slate, um, but our challenge or our, our charge was to put together conservation plans that would dem demonstrate that uh, energy developers can also be good stewards of our land. Uh, if you know anything about development, uh, if you work for an oil and gas company or, or any of the renewables projects, that can be a challenge. Uh, we've got to have energy. It's got to come from various sources. Uh, so it's our job to evaluate those projects and do the best we can to minimize the impact of projects on the landscape. So it, you may be aware oil and gas, typically wells are developed on a, on a certain spacing, maybe 160 acres, maybe 80 maybe all the way down to 20 acre spacing, depending on the railroad commission and field rules at the time. Um, there are not as many guidelines for, or not as much policy in place when it comes to uh, wind farm development and solar field development. So these are things that we have to navigate and they're all intertwined. The Permian Basin's already heavily impacted from uh, an oil and gas standpoint. So our challenge is what can we do to minimize impact? Uh, so we, we have done the best we can to, to identify practices that, that we believe have a positive impact that may even improve the landscape before we got a hold of it. Um, so some of the practices that, that we implement, I should preface this by saying every time I, I talk to somebody about you know, brush management or seeding or something along those lines in, in, the, uh, in the Permian is, you know, why, why are you doing that? You can't grow anything out there. I think we have enough data, some pretty pictures now, uh, to support our work and to show that it can be done if you'll put, put forth the effort and then be patient. Um, you know, we're, we're in about a 12 or 13 inch rainfall zone. Uh, I would say that most of the time it's more like seven or eight, uh, and it's gonna come in, in pretty heavy doses in a short time frame. So what we try to do is, is set the landscape up so that it can take advantage of, of rainfall uh, when it comes. Um, a, a few things that we've really implemented and, and pushed on our surface assets is uh, use of locally adapted native seeds. You, you heard from Colin Shackelford earlier, we work uh, with Texas Native Seeds quite a bit. Uh, the Permian Basin Panhandle Native Seeds project uh, to develop those locally adapted seed sources and then put them into practice. They, they directly, they're directly beneficial to us and what we're trying to do from a, a stewardship stand, standpoint. Uh, so we've done that. Uh, we have integrated those requirements into some of our agreements when we're talking about uh, right-of-ways for um, overhead electric lines or oil and gas takeaway, all of the infrastructure that's associated with energy development. Um, so a lot of restoration, a lot of reclamation work, we actively seek opportunities to apply practices to uh, to take those decommissioned sites, tank batteries, well locations, whatever they may be, and create usable space for wildlife. Um, and we've had some, some really good success, thanks to favorable weather, periodic favorable weather, uh, to show that it can be done. Um, so that's that's been something that we've been able to uh, to show others as well. I should add, we've, we've also worked and encourage collaboration with other entities, Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation, uh, Borderlands Research Institute, CKWRI, uh, Parks and Wildlife, every time we get an opportunity, New Mexico Game and Fish. Uh, we're not shy about seeking out opportunities to collaborate, uh, to put conservation on the ground, and, uh, and at the same time, educate others. Um, and we'll do that again here in, in uh, October, I believe it's been mentioned that there's a, a Quell Appreciation Day uh, that we'll host out there on one of our properties uh, focused primarily on Blue Quell and, and some of the practices that we uh, put into place out there. Um, just to, to kind of give you a flavor of what our normal year is like as far as what do you actually put on the ground. We probably average in the neighborhood of 3,000 to 3,500 acres a year in brush management. That's going to be uh, either chemical control to control, control uh, tar bush or mesquite. Uh, also some uh, mechanical management that primarily focuses on playa restoration. 
uh, managing the, the encroaching mesquite that surrounds those playas, and then habitat connectivity um, and, and restoring grasslands in that area. Uh, just to give you an example of, of one site that we've collected some data on. Uh, we've applied spike or tebuthyron um, on tar bush on a site where we had uh, run transects and, and the productivity there was about 40 to 50 pounds per acre, which is essentially nothing. Um, if you look at eco site descriptions and kind of infer what, what may have been there previously, it would lead you, lead you to believe that it could produce up to 1,100 pounds per acre. Um, and following application, we, that's about what it was. So the potential's there. Um, we just have to be willing to, to put it on the ground and then be patient and let it happen. Um, see that I, I do want to emphasize, you know, I'm with ConocoPhillips, uh, Quail Ranch LLC is a subsidiary of ConocoPhillips. Uh, and we've been given a, a great opportunity to, to put some conservation on the ground there, uh, to employ a couple of, of biologists, uh, formerly with Texas Park and Wildlife and, and other agencies, uh, which gives us some credibility um, when we go out and talk to other folks. But, um, you know, the, the putting practices on the ground, uh, collaborating with others at every opportunity, and, and educating folks both within our uh, corporate organization and then uh, outside of that as well. Uh, you know, it's, it seems like a scattershot approach and it kind of is, uh, but we feel like that's the way it needs to be to have the biggest impact. I think that's all I have, John. All right, thank you, Jesse, for those comments. Thank you, everybody, all the speakers. Um, I think I have a few minutes maybe for questions. Um, we are just a bit behind schedule, but uh, as I tried to pay attention, you know, I picked up on a few things. Um, you guys have all heard this before, but know your plants, pray for rain, know your plants, um, pray for some good luck, keep good records and be flexible. With those four or five things, sounds like you may be spending part of your life on your knees a little bit, but that's not all bad either. So. Uh, yeah, but anyway, I do want to provide opportunities for questions for the group. Uh, if anybody has them, like I said, we have a few minutes. So I think we can do that. And so I think if you speak real loud, maybe we can hear you. If not, I'll try and repeat the questions. If you don't have questions, I may have to ad lib on my own. So questions from the group. Nobody wants to be first. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we followed the. Uh, oh, the question was, do we track how many birds that we harvest given from our surveys? Is that right? So we've always followed the 15 to 20 percent rule and we have never come close to it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. Blue shirt. I don't know that uh, any of these speakers want to address that. Dale, you want to take that? How the parasites are spread from quail to quail? Deal. Uh, the quail eats an infected arthropod, a grasshopper, or a cricket, something like that. The intermediate, the, the, the arthropods are an intermediate host for this eye worm or sequel worm, the eye worm we'll focus on. And when that quail eats that infected grasshopper in the crop, in the crawl, within 15 minutes, those larvae erupt from that grasshopper and travel up the esophagus to the uh, lacrimal ducts and then up into the eyes. So it's a, it's a pretty fascinating story about how they do it. And that's a short story. Thank you, Dr. Rollins. Other questions? 
Well, I'll, I'll throw one out here for the group and you guys, uh, gals, pick and choose who may want to go first or who may want to try and address this. But, you know, we talked about a very various sizes of properties, you know, uh, commercially owned, privately owned. But still, I think the question from an economic standpoint, you know, how do landowners and managers balance the goals of quail conservation with other land use objectives? such as livestock management and or other recreational opportunities and what innovative approaches have been successful in achieving these dual objectives. Celeste's gonna go first. <laughs> Well, we're not commercial and we're not a cattle operation, but I think that um, economically speaking, there's some things that you can do that won't cost you as much money just, you know, by either whether it's decreasing your hunting time or decreasing the birds you kill or, or like I said, trying to up that habitat um, and maybe decreasing your cattle or... Um, vice versa. You, you may have to make a little bit of sacrifice, but um, it doesn't ultimately cost you that much, in my opinion. Many of the costs for us, you know, especially on the pitchfork, have been spreading grain, things, things such as that, or uh, using guided services that we use for 20 years. Um, it probably ate into the profits about 60% of the gross, I would say, something like that. Um, we've, uh, and then of course, we always try to establish a land use against that, you know, and of course we have motor graders, we try to keep our roads bladed, et cetera. But what we've done since then, uh, we changed over to a different uh, way of leasing. We lease all of our country, mainly quail is on the back burner now. Uh, mainly just, just to preserve the quail. We may lease some in my country in, in Circle Bar Ranch. We lease the deer, everything except quail. And if there's quail there, and if I think they can shoot quail, I'll let them shoot quail, but I'll leave it in my, in my neck of the woods. I don't want them shooting birds out there unless I think there's enough to shoot. So our main focus is on the deer, hogs, and the other honey. And so that's how we sort of control our costs and sort of wait on the quail to come back. You know, I talked about Evelyn Browning Garris earlier and what I wanted to finish up with that about, I believe we're in a dry period. And so I think we're gonna be very careful through this dry period. Some of us like me may not live long enough to see the other end of it. I don't know, but um, according to her, it's, it, it should end maybe the next 10 years, I hope. But, uh, um, just, just control the cost. Our other costs, we try to uh, uh, put it in the hunting contract. So about 80 or 90% of our gross is profit is, is from our standpoint of hunting. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll add, uh, I know working with our cattle operators, really me spending the time and effort to explain to them all the stuff that we're doing to manage for these birds and to have a healthier pasture and better habitat also translate to healthier cattle, healthier calves, higher weaning weights, and more productive pasture. You know, on that topic of, of you know, communicating objectives from landowners or managers to people that may lease those properties? Are there specific strategies that anybody would use that you effectively communicate with those people so that everybody is on the same page? You know, I want to add one thing too that, that we've done that it's sort of an indirect cost. Um, we personally, in the last 20 years, put probably 15,000 acres of crop land back to, gra back to grass and taking it out of production. And it took me about 20, 20 years to convince pitchforks to do that. They don't own a, not an acre of cropland today. They've, they put everything they have back to grass. And I have, a, just from my mistakes that I made over the years, there's a line sort of in Knox County there, pretty much due north of here. Going west, I just don't believe it's very profitable to farm unless it's irrigated farming. And so uh, we get, we've seen less gross income, but a little higher profit. And so to me, that's helped, helped quail just that alone. Okay. 
that's a little, little bit different angle for me, but it, you know, communication for us is, is less along the lines of, well, it is. We spend a, a lot of time and effort and money um, implementing practices, you know, water distribution, uh, properly fencing pastures and those kind of things more uh, in collaboration with our grazing lessees. Uh, so that we can better manage the habitat. And our, our focus is, you know, if you ask me, I'm quail all day, every day. Uh, but it's it's also other grassland birds, a lot of the things that we've heard other speakers talk about this morning. Uh, but in our case, um, you know, when managing our, our company on surface and trying to take care of our property, it's communication with contractors, vendors that are working for other oil and gas producers. Um, and that can be a, there can be a, a big miss there. All they know is they're out there to, to lay a line or, or whatever it may be. Uh, so what we've tried to instill in them is, hey, let's, you know, work with us. Let's be thoughtful about, um, you know, please don't lay that flow line over the top of a pack rat midden that also happens to have a quail nest in it. That's actually happened before. Um, so just trying to uh, educate others uh, of what we're trying to do uh, so that, you know, some of the practices that we put into place aren't undone. One last chance from the audience before we, you know, thank these folks again and, and move on to the next panel. Okay, appreciate you guys' participation. Thank you very much. So if the next group of uh, panelists would like to make their way up here, um, this next group is, is titled, um, let me find it in my program, NGOs in Texas. So we have a habit of throwing out uh, acronyms all the time. So if you're not familiar with that, an NGO is a non-governmental organization. And so we have a group of folks here that are gonna visit with us about how we can work together more effectively and, and really Really, you know, effective resource management, regardless of the species, uh, occurs behind some landowner's gate. But there's many challenges associated with that management, and we can enhance those opportunities behind that the landowner's gate through these partnerships that we'll hear from some of these folks coming up next. So they're going to discuss these opportunities that they have for landowners and how others may contribute to conservation through some of those shared activities or direct engagement with those landowners so let me see who's up first so um, our first speaker will be Mr. Andrew Earl, who worked for Texas Wildlife Association as the Director of Conservation. In, in that role, Andrew works with TWA volunteers, committees to develop and advance policy positions impacting Texas wildlife and landowners. He also oversees the organization's family and adult education program. Andrew? Yes, sir. Thank you, John. Uh, Texas Wildlife Association was, uh, I'm sure many folks in this room know, and, and hopefully uh, members, or we can we can make you a member by the end of the day today, uh, was created in 1985 by a group of uh, landowners that were actually kind of upset with uh, some parks and wildlife rulemaking on, on high fence and uh, realized that, you know, by, by banding together and making a voice for private landowners here in the state could really... Uh, affect affect change and, and make a difference and since then has um, focused a mission around as we put it land water wildlife and people and I'll kind <clears> of <throat> focus on that last one the people a bit um, we are we don't do conservation delivery work, but like a lot of the the organizations here in the in the room, we're focused really on on education and and outreach and um, it, building a connection among Texans with the private lands that they own and steward and inhabit. Uh, 1991, the organization partnered with Parks and Wildlife Department on the uh, Texas Big Game Awards program. And in 1997, started uh, partnering with the department on, um, pardon me, the, the Texas Youth Hunt Program, which is really built into the nation's premier uh, program, getting youth 
and this year is actually going to cross uh, the. We'll, we'll we'll get our thirtieth thirty thousandth young Texan uh, out out onto a private land here in in the state of Texas, um, and giving them as a safe mentored youth hunt experience. Um, we also have a really uh, you know work at the ground level to build awareness among young Texans, young Texans in grade school uh, with through our conservation legacy department, which touches about 80,000 kids a year uh, through our discovery trunks program, which we have an example of over there at the table, um, as well as our student expeditions, which are getting yellow school buses out on private lands, putting pretty simply. And you know, what that does is, is one, builds awareness, and then we hope to build on that awareness by, you know, building interest and then engagement and then ultimately, you know, up the ladder, turning young men and women into conservation champions. Um, the one program that's been mentioned a handful of times today is, is uh, our Quail Masters program, which uh, we are very proud of and is uh, really a, an intensive, as, as it's been put, uh, four day, four, I should say, four session, multi day uh, program that, that turns uh, quail students into uh, quail experts and focuses on uh, habitat and population management and, uh, and the human dimensions around quail conservation. And um, those sessions are, are around the state. Graduate credit is available for, the, for that. Um, pardon me, for graduate students through the program and uh, would encourage anyone interested to uh, speak to, as Dr. Rollins said, speak to someone in the room who has gone through the program, speak to Jared over there, who's our adult education specialist. He's gonna be working with, uh, with Dana and the, the team at the Research Foundation to, uh, to host that in the coming year. And um, I'll also plug just briefly on uh, page 39 of your program is uh, an ad for our Wild at Work, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, our Wild at Work um, stewardship series. And just next week on Thursday, Dr. Rollins is going to be speaking to us. Uh, it's a totally free webinar about the uh, about reversing the quail decline. So. Um, you know, that's that's really the bulk of it for me. I will I'll turn it back over to you, John. Well, that cord's going to get me yet. I think. Okay, thank you, Andrew. So our next uh, guest speaker is Ms. Anita Hoskins, and Anita works to administer Audubon's conservation ranching program in Texas and surrounding areas, providing assistance for land managers interested in all areas of conservation. This program now includes more than 100 ranches and nearly 3 million acres. Uh, we're kind of in Anita's backyard. She's based out of nearby Sweetwater. Thank you, John. Hi, I'm Anita Hoskins. So I work in Sweetwater, Texas. I'm a range ecologist for the Audubon Society. Um, and I'd like to echo Jerry Bob here with, I am a rancher first. So don't throw anything at me, but I grew up on a commercial cattle ranch out in Van Horn, Texas. And nowadays I found myself here. What does that have to do with Bob White Quail? Well, let's ask a question of the audience maybe here. Um, who here buys beef? Okay, so quite a few people. A lot of people buy beef. Um, has, who here would be concerned with where their beef grew up or how it was raised? Or maybe the land it was raised on? Okay, what does that have to do with Audubon? Let's actually see who's heard of the National Audubon Society. Okay, so that's a good amount of people. What do a bunch of cargo khaki wearing pants want with our beef and our ranches? And what do they want with Bob White Quail? Well, Audubon recognizes that our ranchers and our landowners are the last thing standing between this great grassland bird decline and a complete loss. With that importance in mind, we've developed the Audubon Conservation Ranching Program. It serves to offer as a market-based program, expanding opportunities for cattle producers to sell their beef in the United States with a special seal. And this seal can be found on page 28 of Bill's programs. It's just like anything that would go on your beef, like an organic seal, but it expands our market. And it tells the producer that 
Your beef has been grown on sustainable lands and it's been grown with birds, especially bobwhite quail, in mind. That being said, who here would be willing to buy beef that was grown with bobwhite quail in mind? I think it would be pretty cool. So we're working on expanding evermore. We're, uh, we have several opportunities to buy beef online. You can get it delivered to your door. And on the producer side, we also offer habitat management plans. That's part of the certification process. These are detailed plans that go into your species of concern on your property, and they will give us the best practices and a series of events that we can go through to uh, maintain that your property is managed with the birds in mind. So, so far in Texas, um, if you've had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Thomas Trader, he has really expanded the program. It's been in Texas since 2017. We have 14 ranches here now and about 87,000 acres, and we're looking to just increase those numbers. So thank you all for the opportunity to be here, and thank you to Dana. All right, very interesting program. So we have a little schedule change. Um, a new guest speaker, Dustin McNabb, was is in your schedule. He was supposed to be here, but uh, had the little health challenge. So we have a very capable stand-in, Mr. Kyle Wesson, with uh, with the Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever. Um, for those of you that went to uh, Mulligan's last night and had a couple beverages, you know, from the local chapter, you know, that's all intertwined and part of that process. And so a lot of fun to work with. But uh, if you're not readily familiar with Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever, it's really a national uh, grassroots uh, habitat conservation effort obviously directed at quail and pheasants across the country but beyond that habitat they also advocate for public access and conservation education uh, both of these activities you know very influential uh, impacting over 300,000 acres here in Texas um, certainly a great partner for landowners and certainly a great partner for Texas Parks and Wildlife so I'll turn it over to, to Kyle. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, very excited to be here. I am a huge quill nerd and um, was not expecting to get up here to talk, so I'm not really sure how this is going to go. But uh, bottom line, Pheasants Forever uh, started with a group of pheasant hunters up in the Minnesota area who wanted to do something about the declining populations of pheasants. So they started Pheasants Forever in about 1982. And um, and from there, the organization has grown prolifically in the, the Midwest and has expanded in 2005, where we started making reaches into the southern uh, portion of the states and quail world and started Quail Forever uh, in 2005. Uh, like John mentioned, we're a grassroots model, so uh, our chapters uh, get to decide what to do with 100% of their profits uh, within their communities, whether it's habitat work, education, outreach, advocacy. Um, so uh, that's something that um, uh, continues to this day throughout all of our chapters. I think we're around about 754 chapters um, nationwide, and um, we are uh, really excited to see what we can do as we're growing here, specifically in the state of Texas, um, to help the, uh, the, the quail uh, world and, and ultimately make more birds here in Texas. Um, so thank you. All right, guys like Kyle will get on schedule pretty quick. Um, so this last gentleman uh, probably needs no introduction. Um, if you haven't been paying attention yesterday, today, haven't been engaged in the you know quail business, uh, you know Park City's quail coalition, Jay Stein, you know, have been such a, a great partner. I expect that most of you are somewhat familiar with them now, but uh, very focused on research, as was described by Joe earlier, uh, conservation, and then more importantly, probably for all of our uh, futures, is the engagement of young folks to preserve that quail hunting heritage. So Jay's going to talk a little bit about Park City's quail, the engagement we have with them for quail, and what we can look forward to in the future. So. Thank you, John. I got lucky that Joe kind of set the stage for me with a little bit of a history, but 
Uh, as you know, Quail Coalition uh, started as Quail Unlimited back in the day, and to be quite honest, we just got tired of uh, sending most of that money out of state and started Park City's Quail Coalition, and then the other chapters in Texas that were Quail Unlimited chapters joined, and that's how we formed Quail Coalition. Uh, it's been a great history. As Joe mentioned, uh, in just over 18 years, we've raised $30 million. Uh, that's put a lot of the uh, quail researchers in here, uh, hopefully on good footing, and, you know, uh, funded tons of quail research. Uh, as Dale will mention, the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch. Uh, Park City's Quail funds, funds their annual operating budget each year, and then several of the other chapters uh, pitch in to help buy equipment and uh, bridge the gap to get things done. Um, one of the ways uh, we can get involved is to volunteer with your local chapter committee. Uh, we have chapters, you'll see our map over here with chapters all over Texas. Uh, we've got a few places we'd love to open a chapter. Uh, Abilene being one, we've had a few questions today, uh, how to get a chapter started in Abilene. Uh, we've, we've been working on one in Lubbock as well. Uh, Midland is our, our newest chapter, which uh, just got started about four years ago. It took a little while to get it going, but now they're raising 250000 a year. Uh, and Jesse's here. Uh, Jesse Wood was here. We fund a lot of projects in his backyard uh, in the Permian Basin and the Trans-Pecos region. Um, you know, another way you can help is just buy a membership. That funds our operating budget. Uh, as Joe mentioned, we're very low uh, overhead, limited staff. Uh, we did double our staff last year from one to two, uh, so we could cover a little more ground. Uh, but we really try to focus on just putting all the money back uh, on the ground for quail habitat and research. Um, we've got a, a tons of great research projects. The medicated feed is a, a fascinating development that we hope uh, really makes an impact, and we'll be testing that more in the next few years. Uh, should be approved very soon, hopefully on the market in the next year or so. Another great project that we funded, uh, several of the chapters, uh, primarily Houston and the Park Cities chapter, is the uh, East Texas uh, Quail Restoration with the Western Piney, Word, Piney Woods Quail Program for Tall Timbers. I know Brad Kovetsch is going to talk about that later, but I'm not going to steal his thunder, but they've been very successful in reestablishing wild quail uh, in the Piney Woods and fascinating results that, uh, quite honestly, can't even be explained. Um, but, you know, we raise our money through our fundraising events. Hopefully a lot of you have been to those. Um, we have an annual dinner at, at just about every chapter, and we, we raise the money off raffle, raffle tickets. Um, that's one way you can help. If, if you're interested, we're always looking for donations. I know Steve Snell's here. Gundog Supply is a big supporter. And, uh, you know, we get a, a donation, raise money with raffle tickets, uh, live auction items. Uh, we have great, lots of great live auction items across the state. Uh, we have several events coming up. Uh, Bill Rouse here somewhere of our South Texas chapter events next weekend. And then we have three in October. So uh, follow us on social media. That's a good way to stay engaged. Uh, we, we have uh, a magazine that goes out every year if you're a member, and we're signing up members over here at our booth. Uh, Mary's back here. She can get you signed up. I know a lot of you have already today, and a lot of you already are members. And uh, just find a chapter locally. We've got our Wichita Falls chapter well represented out here, and uh, try to get engaged that way. Um, it's a great way to meet people, network, and uh, get to know more quail hunters. And... Uh, have a good time and, and also take a, ki a kid hunting as Joe mentioned you know we're not getting any younger the next uh, generation is going to be our future so um, the more kids we can get hunting keep this thing going uh, we need quail hunters and the quail need quail hunters so uh, that's really all I have uh, you can follow us on our social media we've got both Park City's Quail and Quail Coalition Facebook and uh, Instagram pages and that kind of keeps you engaged we've got snake clinics, dog training clinics, uh, keeps you up to date on all our annual dinners. And we certainly appreciate all the support of our donors and, and volunteers. Uh, the volunteers at the local level is really what makes this thing tick. And we're very proud of what we accomplished and uh, look to keep expanding that in the future. Thank you, Jay. 
So uh, Jay must have got a copy of the questions that I had because he ticked through most of those things I was going to ask. But I'll, I'll throw it back to you folks in the crowd if you have uh, questions for any of these folks about uh, how you can better engage or maybe how they can collaborate better with you or your group. Um, I think what's interesting to me being a, a state employee and, and we rely on all these folks and various factors, different meetings and, and through work because none of us, you know, can really accomplish this on our own, whether you are that landowner or that state resource agency, we are all so much more successful when we work together. And there's, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity, whether that's just staff capacity, sometimes some expertise, knowledge, sometimes it's money. You know, I know on our side, you know, we'll fund positions with some of these entities and sometimes they'll help us fund positions so there's there's a tremendous amount of back and forth and and really the the message that I received from these folks is, uh, is a couple things you know uh, opportunity awareness and education and uh, Jay was promoting several opportunities they had you know across the state to, uh, to talk about educating people and getting them engaged Do any of the other group have other um, educational opportunities coming up or how to engage with the public hunters or non-hunters that you want to share with the group or well I would I would echo what's been said and you know keep keeping an eye on uh, on our website and on our calendar we constantly have have landowner workshops and field workshops uh, up and are currently have a series focused on on small acreage and um, be new and beginning landowners which I think is a, is a great place um, as we're we're looking at the land trends across the state and, and where things are headed um, a great place for for you or, or your neighbors or kids to to get involved and and uh, become ambassadors. What about, uh, you know, direct opportunities for volunteers to participate in field work associated with your NGOs? Uh, are there opportunities like that that you're aware of and you can share with the group? Yeah, we have um, our, our website at quillforever.org is um, very user friendly, has uh, an event center area where you can actually uh, plug in your location and it'll pull up any uh, event that's going on throughout all our chapters in the state uh, or in your region. And uh, from there, you can decide to show up. It might be just a, a habitat uh, awareness type deal. Uh, maybe they're doing some habitat work on some public land. Uh, it could be a youth hunt or um, a women on the wing initiative. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities there on the website uh, through our events center that you can look up and find those uh, to get it involved and then of course just you know uh, identifying those local chapters and uh, and just inquiring and seeing how you might be able to want to get involved there go ahead Anita. Yeah, so Audubon, Texas has quite a few centers across the state, and these are properties where we uh, use different habitat management techniques and use them for public education. Um, they're open to the public, and they're available for also lots of kids' programs, and so we find a lot of success with those. Nita, I'm curious how that conversation starts with a ranch or a ranch manager to get them engaged in your program for the for the beef and stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that? Or is that through a public forum? Is that a one-on-one -on -one conversation? How do you get that started? So typically, yes, sir, it would be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. A lot of people are curious first, you know, about the seal, and they wonder, um, usually the first question is, how much will I get per pound? Um, while we can't guarantee how much you'll get per pound, we do have people that find a lot of success when they market their own beef and are able to use our steel. Do they have to be participating at any certain level, number of head per year or anything like that? Or? Not at the time, no, sir. Yeah. Interesting. Questions? I'll get us a little bit ahead to the break, maybe. I don't know whether we can quit early or... Looking for some guidance from somebody, but uh, she says she's ready for the break. So, in the back. Okay, Five till three, be back in your seats if you want to get lucky and win. So, thanks everybody. Thank the speakers too.
Door prize time. Okay, our first door prize item is going to be a package of items. One is going to be two nice looking caps from Gun Dog Supply, a uh, gun sock from Park City Quail, and a um, journal, nice leather bound journal from. Uh, Park City's quail, and then a photographic guide to the vegetation of the South Texas sand sheet. And Tom, did you donate that? I'm not sure. I apologize. I'm not sure who got that. But that's a package. So, Olivia, who we got? 106. 106. 106. Now, I had three people come up to me at the break and say, I'm sorry, I had my thumb up in the ear and I didn't want to pay attention. Pay attention here. Olivia and I are going to split whatever's not claimed. 106. Got a winner. All right. Where's my young ladies from the Quail Ranch? I need somebody delivering door prizes here. Thank you. All right, next we got a gift pack, uh, package from uh, Quill Coalition, Park City's Quill Coalition. Two nice caps, a his and hers Yeti mug, and a boot puller, all from Park City's Quail. So who we got for this one, Olivia? Number 187. 187. 187. Hey, this is definitely ladies' night, I'll tell you what. That's good. We're proud you ladies are here. Which we trust you. Nobody else claimed it, so we'll trust you. Yeah, that's all, that's all yours. Every bit of it. Okay, next we have a, uh, a nice uh, cooler bag from Capital Farm Credit. And... It looks to be about probably 15 pounds worth of uh, native grass seed, I believe. Let me see what that is. Yeah, that's native grass seed uh, from Turner Seed Company, our good friends over there in Breckenridge. So pretty good uh, little chunk of change on that. Who's the winner here, Olivia? 190. 190. 190. Okay, a little quicker to claim that grass seed. And then our last door prize is, uh, again, two two nice caps, a uh, package, two nice caps from Gundog Supply, a GPS unit for your dog uh, donated by Big Country Veterinary. I'm not familiar with what this is, a Nemo GPS. Uh, so... Track your dogs locally, and Danny, you've got one. Works pretty well. Okay, you're ineligible. And then the last thing being a, a really nice gun cleaning kit donated by uh, uh, Capital Farm Credit, I believe. Okay. 108. 108. Today's current temperature. 108. Anybody? 108 going once, 108 going twice. Check your tickets, please. 108. All right, next ticket. 113. 113. 113. Nobody? Got a winner? Better shout out or it'll be gone. I got a packet of items here. Thanks again to our donors. A couple of quick announcements before I turn it back to John for the second panel. We will, uh, the, the plant and seed contest will close at 6.30 today. And again, as you participate in those, there will be a special door prize drawing for the seed ID contest. So be sure and take both those. 
The silent auction will close at 7 p.m. during dinner. And Dana, I was supposed to make one other announcement. What was it? The evaluations, you don't do the evaluations until tomorrow morning. We don't want you trying to fill those out now and, and talking good or bad about us before it's all over. So you'll get those distributed in the morning and again be eligible for a short door prize ticket, the 50 inch Samsung TV donated by Park City's Quail for those people that turn in a uh, course evaluation tomorrow. And with that, John, we'll turn it back to you for the next panel. Thank you, Dale. If uh, the next group of panelists can uh, start heading this way, I'd appreciate that. Um, we have four more distinguished guests that are going to share some thoughts with you. This next panel discussion is going to is titled Quail Habitat Program and Services for the Landowner and Manager. And when I contemplate what that title may mean to me, that's conservation delivery, which is what much of this conversation has been about. Um, and another way to look at that is, is how can we or how can they help you uh, manage your property for better quail habitat? We know we can't make it rain, but many of these folks here today uh, can help you put the other pieces of those puzzles together and uh, hopefully uh, enhance the opportunities for, for quail on your property. So um, I must have another schedule change. Do I have a Megan Armstrong? Yeah. That's not you. So you're filled in. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'll just turn it right over to you. I'm going to assume you're from the NRCS, much like Megan was, and uh, going to visit with us about uh, Texas Grazing Lands Coalition and, and what's going on, maybe. Yeah. I do apologize for the sudden uh, tag in there. Uh, Megan, another, another, she's under the weather, and uh, so I. I'm going to try to step in here, uh, but the Texas Grazing Land Coalition, I'll just put in a, a brief plug about that in terms of um, how we fit into this quail, uh, the end of the picture here, uh, the Grazing Land, Texas Grazing Lands Coalition, it's a state chapter of a national chapter. It's a national organization. It's a nonprofit organization, and uh, it was kind of started uh, as a means to maintain a local hub of information, connect these ranchers, um, connect the ranchers that are doing a good job with ones that would like to do better possibly. And uh, and uh, the NRCS kind of took this concept and um, went with it and they hired, uh, in Texas at least, Texas is the only state that does this, they hired regional grazing specialists. Uh, Megan was one. I am a, uh, I'm another one based out of Snyder. Uh, there's 11 coalitions in the state. So um, wherever your operation is in the state, there's probably a coalition that, that covers it. Now, um, as the name implies, Grazing Lands Coalition, the specialists in the areas, we're gonna focus mainly on the livestock management aspect of it. Uh, Mr. Daniels said a while ago that, uh, you know, cattle and quail can complement one another. And that's 100% true. And where do we fit into the, the partnerships and the, the foundational habitat side of it is that um, your regional coalitions, your local ranchers that are part of those coalitions, your local grazing specialists, uh, we're a, a source of assistance, uh, technical assistance, ideas, brainstorming, uh, whatever. Um, we're talking about a livestock operation that wants to integrate some wildlife, wants to better their uh, well habitat. That's completely 100% doable, but it you know it needs to be well thought out. It needs to have some information behind it, and it, it uh, you know it's a process. So. Uh, your local grazing specialists are a source for that. Um, uh, my name is Matthew Kaufman. I'm out of the Snyder office. Um, and like I said, there's uh, 10 specialists around the state. So look us up and uh, we're there to help. So thank you. all Thank you, Matthew, for filling in so capably. Um, everybody likes surprises every once in a while. Um, 
The next speaker I'm a little bit more familiar with, um, he's been around business for a while, and his name is uh, Manuel DeLone, and he's spent 11 years previously working for the Fish and Wildlife Service before he went to the Natural Resource Conservation Service, or NRCS as we so commonly refer it to. Um, he was a district conservationist in Muleshoe, and then went on to be a resource team leader overseeing three field offices. In 2009, he became the Zone 1 Wildlife Biologist in Lubbock, uh, covering 51 counties there in the Panhandle and South Plains. And just recently, this past April, he became the State Wildlife Biologist in, uh, for Texas. And again, uh, as an agency, we're very excited that you're in that role, and we look forward to the successes we'll have together. So, Anna, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you for the introduction again, Manuel De Leon. Just want to add real quick to what Matt was talking about. Matt has one of the sweetest jobs within RCS. He doesn't have to deal with uh, our programs, our assessment tools, or any of that. So uh, he's got the fun job. He gets to go out and, and work with y'all and develop those plans that eventually will roll into these uh, financial assistance programs that I'll talk about. Uh, as you all know, we have the alphabet uh, of uh, the alphabet soup of programs. I'll try to explain them all, and hopefully if we have time for questions, uh, I'd be glad to try to answer as best I can. Uh, our first program is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Of course, it's our flagship program that helps, uh, you know, helps you, your, the land stewards, uh, to protect the resources, to manage for wildlife. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been around since the 90s, and it's a very popular program. And, of course, you know, recently with the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, there's going to be some additional influx of funds coming into that. Uh, we're hiring people, uh, so we do appreciate y'all working with our, our younger folks. You know, we all had to start somewhere, so, you know, please bear with us and have patience uh, with us as we do, you know, work to, to develop our employees to, to better serve you. But our Environmental Quality Incentives Program, uh, last year, I don't have any acreage on figures, uh, but last year we had a little over uh, $86 million that was uh, allocated in the state of Texas. And of course, that includes anything from irrigation practices to brush management, to fence and water development for livestock management. Uh, so it's truly, as I mentioned, our flagship program and, and is there for, for folks to, to use. Uh, the next program we have is our conservation stewardship program, basically a program that helps build on your existing uh, conservation efforts. In this program, we, have, we do use our conservation practices, but there's also some additional enhancements uh, that can be done on your operation. Uh, again, it stems from, from cropland uh, to rangeland to wildlife uh, habitat land. Uh, last year, we did a little north of $10 million uh, on the conservation stewardship program. Uh, <clears throat> We also have the Conservation Stewardship Grassland Conservation Initiative. Uh, it's basically a program that helps uh, keep working lands working lands. It provides, I believe last year was $15 an acre uh, for grazing operations. There has to be a minimal amount of brush. You know, it's something determined locally. It's, it was mentioned earlier by John uh, about our, our uh, loss of grassland habitats. And so, you know, trying to maintain those habitats and or improve those habitats uh, to keep them in grasslands. Uh, and FY22 did about a uh, little over a million dollars in the Grassland Conservation Initiative. Uh, another program we have is the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Uh, it's one that I'm not extremely familiar with, but we'll get up to speed soon uh, in my new role. Uh, but <clears throat> currently we have uh, a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation PECOS partnership. Uh, we have the Hill Country Headwaters Conservation Initiative with the Hill Country Conservancy. Uh, we have a restoring perennial flow in Comanche Springs with the Texas Water Trade. Uh, we have the Texas Coastal Prairie Initiative with the Coastal Prairie Conservancy. And then we have the Greater Big Bend Conservation Partnership with Sol Ross State University. And this is a way to leverage funds uh, within RCS funds, plus what the partnership brings 
uh, to the table. And, and in this particular instance, it can include in kind, uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be monetary. Uh, on the easement side, we do have an easement program. Uh, we, it's pretty tough uh, when the land values uh, are pretty high for us to compete with that, but it is an opportunity uh, for folks that are interested. We have an ag land easement program, and then we also have a wetland reserve easement program. Uh, just a few figures here. Uh, total right now in the state of Texas, uh, there's a little over 2,000 uh, acres of uh, what we call agricultural conservation easement program, wetland reserve easement, again, a mouthful and a, a alphabet soup. Uh, <clears throat> we have about 22,000 acres of grassland program. Again, these are easements. These can be uh, 30 years or in perpetuity. Uh, it's your choice. And then our WRP, which was the initial program for the wetlands, we have uh, about 95,000 acres uh, that are in the wetland reserve program. We also have initiatives um, that we, we leverage some of these equip, equip dollars that basically comes from the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. We have the Lesser Prairie Chicken Initiative uh, that targets habitats up uh, in the north. We have the Longleaf Pine Initiative and then we have the Working Lands for Wildlife, which the Lesser Prairie Chicken Initiative is a part of. But we also have the Great Plains Biome, uh, folks, it's basically running from North Dakota, Montana, down here to Texas. Uh, and again, trying to restore some of these grasslands by treating some of that brush. And then as John mentioned, we have the Northern Bob White Grassland Savannas. So we have a, a program specifically for Bob Whites. And of course, we have some additional initiatives like for Monarch. Uh, we have some water quality initiatives, but in particular for, for this group, uh, you know, for example, the, the northern bobwhite and grassland savannas would be uh, applicable or appropriate. And uh, I want to speak for our sister agency, the Farm Service Agency. Uh, they do have the Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, of course, that's a general sign up uh, to retire those lands to put them in 10, 15 year contracts. Uh, definitely one of the best programs that's going for conservation. A lot of opportunity and uh, you know work that can be done on those properties to, to better manage or enhance for wildlife. And then they also have the uh, Continuous Conservation Program, which is, as the name implies, it's continuous. You can sign up at any time. Uh, it's not competitive and uh, it, it depends on what you're looking. There's riparian uh, buffers, herbaceous cover, uh, there's uh, well uh, well buffers. There's there's a variety of practices that FSA uh, can offer. And just recently, working with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, we have the State Acres for Wildlife Enhancement, the Prairie Safe, uh, which covers a bigger area uh, up in the Panhandle and, and South Plains. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over back to you. Thank y'all. Thank you, Manuel. So switching back a little bit to the uh, NGO side of our, our uh, partnerships, uh, Mr. Thomas Yankee, Yankee has uh, served as the inaugural Texas State Coordinator for Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever over the past year. Prior to that role, Thomas was their uh, t t prescribed fire coordinator. Uh, through his current efforts, he has a growing team of biologists that are privileged and excited to be able to work with and learn from numerous landowners and managers and conservation partners across the state on both private and public lands in many capacities concerning upland habitat management. Thomas? Thank you, John. Good seeing you. Well, thank you all for allowing me and Derek, Manuel, and Matt to be up here visiting with y'all, and, and as John said, learning from y'all. It's a, it's a blessing and a privilege to be here. And I've been been fortunate to, um, to get to work for different entities and learn from a lot of folks from around the state. In the last three years, it's been with an organization called Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever. And up until I got that job as fire coordinator, I really didn't know who the heck PF or QF is or was in Texas. And at that time, Derek was working for us, and uh, there was there was five people on staff. So just in 2020, and now we're up to 14 here in Texas, and and more growth in the works right now. But um, 
to better state who we are and what we do. As Kyle mentioned earlier, Pheasants Forever is uh, based out of Minnesota, started in 82. Um, and just trying to figure out, you know, what can we do to conserve pheasants up in the Midwest? And in the, in the 1990s, early 2000s, somebody had an epiphany saying, you know, there's a big correlation between that Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP, and the amount of pheasants. And so they started realizing, hey, if we can, if we can uh, fund an additional wildlife-based staff member in an NRCS office to help more landowners sign up for more CRP, we can get more pheasants on the landscape. Well, that model has not only been successful, but has grown. And now we are based in over 40 states. Um, I don't, uh, I'm not gonna try to flaunt stats, I don't fully know, but uh, we're one of the, one of the biggest um, biologist organizations in the country right now. And as of this year, we have over 500 team members across the country. And Texas is poised with a lot of growth. And, and what makes that possible, we're not the ones that are just taking the charge leading the way. We're able to work with a lot of partners, work with all of these gentlemen up here and many of you in the audience and figure out, hey, what needs to be done to actually get good upland habitat on the ground? And yes, we're at a quail symposium. Yes, our name is Quail Forever, as well as Pheasants Forever. But we do so much more than just those two birds. And that's been a big connection for us is when visiting with the landowner, visiting with the partner, what, what is that connection between healthy upland habitats? And with funding opportunities the way they are right now, with monarch money or with other things, you know, yeah, we, uh, we do a whole lot more than just talking about quail and pheasants. How can we have healthy, healthy habitats so we can have healthy water, healthy soils, clean air, resiliency, sustainability, all the things all of us want. And our organization is able to work with others and do that. And so again, the power partnerships or some, some of our uh, partners have said force multipliers. But right now in Texas, we, we have uh, many of our team members based over there at our booth or sitting nearby. I like to, they go by different titles depending on how their grants are funding them and what their job responsibilities are. But I like to call them all partner biologists if we were to collectively combine them. And most of them are associated with an NRCS office. We have good representation and a growing representation up in the panhandle. That's actually where we started. Manuel, I believe you told me that that partnership and relationship around, started around 2010 yes. and, and has ebbed and flowed. And, and again, just three years ago, we were at five. Now we're at 14 team members and, and based in different parts of the state saying, hey, where can we add a wildlife influence to assist landowners and not only technical guidance, site visits, but also if and when they have an interest in doing wildlife habitat work on their properties, using the opportunities at hand with USDA programs or other programs that Derek's going to talk about, or even U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, TPWD, et cetera, having somebody else to, to fill in the gap on, on being able to, to do all that paperwork. And so we, we by no means are better or worse than anybody else. We're another resource for landowners, a free resource to landowners. And so in addition to, to help and promote different conservation programs, we also uh, work on public access. One of our team members works directly with Texas Parks and Wildlife and works a lot with our voluntary public access habitat incentive program basically leasing private lands to be publicly accessible for hunting opportunities. And we all know that that's a challenge here in Texas, especially if you're looking for a place to publicly hunt quail. And then a new new position that uh, started for our organization, Josh Mickness back there, and he's, he's our precision ag and conservation specialist. And trying to find that link, not only on connecting rangelands, in conservation, but now farmland and conservation. And Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong but I think the slogan is um, farm the best, conserve the rest. Right. Meaning if you got marginal land, and I believe another speaker mentioned it earlier, at some point in time, you're kind, you're kind of pissing in the wind is, is the amount of input 
whether it be fertilizer or lack of rain you got going into the soil and the amount of revenue you generate, well, what's an alternative means that you can do to that so you're not just wasting your money? How about we put it in perennial grasses or forbs that's beneficial to, to wildlife? And that's where Josh can come in and basically be an, an additional agronomist to folks and talk about, hey, here's some alternative thoughts. And um, that's, that's where we're at right now. We, another ability we have working with our partners, be it NRCS or Parks and Wildlife or others, is being an NGO, we have a little bit less red tape, especially when it comes to doing prescribed fire. And that's that's one of the things our organization is a very strong advocate of and helping uh, assisting landowners with burning. So like these partners, we are um, the landowner still the, the burn boss. We are not a contractor, but we can be there not only helping write burn plans, but we can help uh, physically be there implementing the fires. And, and that's where we're at now. And and there's some things in the work we're, we're hoping to emulate some other states that have quail forever strike teams where we can actually do the habitat work and be the burn boss. And so that's going to be a game changer when that happens here. And so it ultimately not only trying to figure out what is what is a landowner need to best conserve their resources, but what does the landscape need? What is that resource concern and how can we work together as partners landowners be it on public or private lands and actually uh, or do stuff at a meaningful scale so that the birds whether it be quail whether it be pollinators whether it be grassland birds etc are heading in a good direction so thank you all for the opportunity Thank you, Thomas. So uh, to wrap up these remarks on this particular panel, we have uh, Mr. Derek Wiley, who actually began his career, you know, north of here a little bit in, in the great state of Oklahoma uh, as their upland game bird biologist. But we were able to uh, convince him to come back to Texas not too long after that. And he started out as the coordinating wildlife biologist, as Thomas re uh, mentioned, with Quail Forever and the Oaks and Prairie Joint Venture. And, and in 2018, he would begin working more on native grassland management. He's currently the conservation delivery specialist for Texas Parks and Wildlife, as well as the Oaks and Prairie Joint Venture, administering uh, the Grassland Restoration Incentive Program, uh, training partner staff on landscape scale conservation efforts, and promoting our partners' conservation efforts across the Oaks and Prairie Joint Venture. Um, I'm sure Derek will describe that a little bit about what that geography looks like, but they had another good opportunities to, to do good conservation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sure appreciate the uh, opportunity to come talk to you guys about about conservation delivery and how we sort of make an impact on landscape scale for, for a bird that we all hold, um, you know, very dear. Um, I run the Grassland Restoration Incentive Program, and that covers 30 counties in Texas and, and 10 in Oklahoma, kind of up to 35 each side all the way up to the Kansas line. Um, but we're focused purely on native grasslands. And so we take um, seven kind of select practices from basically NRCS equip list. They've got, I think, 680 something practices available. And so that's a, that's a lot. So we um, narrow that down to seven so that we're focused purely on, on grasslands, grassland restoration, grassland birds. Um, Bob whites are, you know, one of our focal species, obviously, um, resonates well with a lot of people, um, but we have quite a few other species that we track as well that, that um, you know, the, the habitat types are fairly similar that we're trying trying to restore. Um, so that's kind of kind of what we do. It started in 2014, um, really late 13, but anyway, uh, we've treated a little over 140,000 acres in that time. Uh, some of it is with NRCS money. We hold an RCPP as well, um, and we take dollars from partnerships across, across the state and let that into an RCPP to put more money on the ground to, to help landowners get where they want to go with native grasslands management. Uh, we tend to focus a lot on prescribed fire and prescribed grazing like Thomas mentioned and 
one thing that we've all sort of talked about a little bit is sort of the power of partnerships and, and leveraging everything that we possibly can to tackle a problem that is, uh, you know, massive in scale across the entire Great Plains. Um, I spent last week in Wyoming at the America's Grasslands Conference uh, talking about woody encroachment problems and losing iconic species. And, uh, you know, that's that's what we're fighting here. And it was super depressing at that meeting. And MAP's been up a couple of times um, uh, today looking at Texas and how we're sort of written off at this point because of the severe woody encroachment that we're that we're fighting and that's that's you know super depressing to think about that you know all of us in this room we're really interested in this bird um, but uh, you know uh, conservation level at uh, continental scale is is um, is depressing for this part of the world so um, that's sort of what we're thinking about what we're doing and uh, taking as many uh, different organizations as we can to, to make a difference for for a bird that we would like to see recover so well, these guys are short and sweet make me look good on this schedule somebody take note of that maybe there's an extra door prize or something um, so what I've learned from listening to these folks again I mentioned this on a previous panel but you know it sounds like we're all in the opportunity business and as bad as it sounds from a government employee is it's how can we or how can they help you you know improve habitat on your on your property um, some of the advantage I see with that through the number of people that Thomas has, all the great staff that the NRCS has, is you know there's a tremendous amount of technical expertise available to landowners, uh, resource managers across the state. We don't go into any of those situations thinking that, you know, that we are the experts and this is the only thing to do. We want to provide you some ideas that maybe, you know, can improve uh, habitat on your property help you better manage that incorporate that with livestock the other advantage that many of these folks have that that is important to some especially when you're trying to balance the bottom, bottom line is they do have financial resources access to financial resources to do those habitat projects and i think that's important the other thing I think is is if if they don't have the answer, they will know somebody that can provide you the answer to get you the help you need. Uh, again, find those resources uh, to to get that work done. You know, lots of different opportunities they talked about from mulching to restoration, new plantings, and so on and so on. But a couple of these folks also, you know, made mention of prescribed fire and one of the in my opinion, you know, one of, if not the best tool you can have in your toolbox. It doesn't come without some trepidation, you know, for from much of Texas, especially East Texas, East of I-35, we pretty much lost the fire culture in Texas. And, and our agency, many of these groups, many people in this room have re been trying to recultivate that fire culture. And, and there's various opportunities to help you landowners through that apprehension, you know, even if it's just as simple as the planning, you know, coordinating with your county officials, when's the best time to do that too. Again, as Thomas mentioned, we do this in our agency as well uh, is just to, to help you implement it from start to finish you know on that on that burn day so it is the best tool you have um, I really encourage you to take advantage of, of some of these opportunities that these folks have and as I pull up my questions I'll look for some questions in the crowd that we can uh, further this conversation a little bit with these folks pretty quiet. I, I have a question for Thomas. You mentioned uh, labor availability for prescribed burns. How do we go about requesting that? So Dr. Rollins asked that I mentioned uh, that we are able to assist landowners with prescribed burns and, and we I'm going to also mention Texas Parks and Wildlife, and there's a couple others in various parts of the state. Our, our resources to landowners interest. But hey, how can how can you potentially see if we can help you out? You know, what's the method of doing that? I would say talk to your local biologist or Quail Forever team member or NRCS staff. Most of us know work work with each other. Our, for instance, with my Quail Forever team members. Yes, we right now we have around 10 field staff and they're based out of 
uh, most of them are based out of NRCS offices, but we are not confined to any counties. So we work outside the counties that we're based out of. A lot of them, a lot of the team members have focal coverage areas, so they cover multiple counties to begin with. But our organization allows us and supports us to travel as need be to help get burns done. And so it's just a matter of connecting with it and or connecting with our our team or even we've we've assisted Parks and Wildlife on burns and vice versa. And so just figuring out, you know, who is that best avenue for the landowner? Uh, who who do the who does that manager have a trusting working relationship with? You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be with us, but at times we're called to, to be additional personnel and we don't mind doing that either, even if it's not our primary contact. So. So you're saying then that you will actually participate in the execution of the plan? So, so our, our, our organization has the ability to help a landowner go out like everybody else in this room or everybody else up on this panel, go out and assess your property, figure out what is that, what is, what is needed to reach your goals and the resource concerns. And if that goal is fire, our team can absolutely help you figure out a burn plan, figure out what are those needs from the landowner side of things. What is it that we, or maybe some of our partners have the ability to bring to the table. And then we also have the ability to help monitor weather and figure out, does it does it fall in accordance with all the legal requirements as well as meet the prescription to accomplish a burn to that is set for the goals and then yes we are physically able to be there to assist the landowner with the burn and those all accurate those those prescribed fire opportunities very similar to what thomas described are available through texas parks and wildlife too we have what we call regional fire coordinators scattered across the state they'll come meet with you on your property help you step by step go through that uh, burn plan and then then we'll uh, bring some of our staff out on the appropriate time to help you initiate complete that fire the only thing that texas parks and wildlife ask is is we want you to invite your neighbors to to if for no other reason just to observe we're not asking everybody to drag a drip torch or do anything like that but we do want people to come out and see fire on the ground because it it, it is the best tool in my opinion that you have in your toolbox so. yes sir does the question was does NRCS have any kind of subsidy for the loss of prescribed grazing after a burn? Is that correct? Uh, not necessarily a subsidy, but there is a prescribed grazing opportunity that we could do as a follow up through our practice 528, which is prescribed grazing. Uh, and that, I don't remember what that pays, but there are opportunities to you know, maybe offset a little bit. Uh, it may not be, you know, enough for you, but it's just something that we'd have to take a look at uh, and, and see how it would fit into uh, your operation and your budget. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, this one, yeah. Uh, yes, sir, there, there is a per acre incentive to uh, begin a grazing management plan, which could be used to offset any losses you've got from doing a burn. But as far as a direct, you burn this many acres and we're going to pay you this to make up for the grazing loss. No. So I'll jump in there a little bit on that too. So through our program and, and theirs as well, we can pay for the fire on a per acre basis for that, but then you can also get a, a grazing deferment payment um, if, if necessary. It's three ish dollars an acre, I think right now uh, for, for a one year deferral. Any I just wanted to vouch for the prescribed burn. I mean, I've got small acreage in Stevens County, and I see four of the guys here that were on my burn working the ground. Derek, Thomas, Mitch, and William. It, they made it so easy. I'm a city boy with some country land. I wanted to do it, and they held our hands and let us hold the torches, my wife and I, but they were right there alongside us, calming our fears, and making it happen. Well, we all, I guarantee you, appreciate those comments because that's our goal is to make people comfortable with fire and because uh, there are a tremendous amount of benefits to include grazing, to include wildlife. 
Appreciate that, Mr. Johnny. And if since we're on the topic of fire, I think it's also worth noting that throughout Texas, there are multiple prescribed burn associations. So if you're not familiar with that, that is an idea of, of neighbor helping neighbor. It's a, it's a, I don't think we have any direct uh, land or uh, direct representation here on this panel, but there might be some of you in the audience familiar with it, that it's a, it's a group of landowners interested in burning. And instead of saying, Hey, I have all the necessary equipment I need. I have all the ATVs, all the sprayers, all the drip torches, et cetera, all the staff, you know, I can do my own. Well, that's, that's great in those scenarios, but that doesn't happen very often, especially the smaller the acreage you get. And so it's, it's, Individuals coming together, um, across, whether it be an end of a single county or multiple counties, having having meetings, and then they they work together on trainings, on helping each other out. They pool their resources. Sometimes the or, they the prescribed burn association itself has some equipment, but a lot of times it's just neighbors having a uh, an avenue to best communicate with each other, saying, "Hey, my goal for this season is to burn." I have my fire breaks prepared to, you know, whatever I feel it's necessary or I've been recommended necessary. And then they help each other complete the burn. So in addition to organizations such as Quail Forever, Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, and, and even some others in the state, prescribed burn associations are a, a great resource in your area if you have them. And if you don't, consider starting some. I know they're in the process of uh, considering starting one right now, uh, kind of, I'm going to say southeast of Austin or kind of that Gonzales County area. And so we're excited that there's interest in starting another uh, PBA here in the state. Uh, so stand up uh, on seat manual. So this might be more, more directed to, to Beth and Manuel. With a lot of your costing and programs, um, so the, this is going to be a very specific question. There's, there's been a bit of a push lately for uh, carbon credits and, and carbon sequestration. And in order to enroll in a lot of those programs, you have to sign your property into some sort of a, um, an easement. Is there anything in that that stands up to you guys that would then preclude landowners down the line if they're getting that financial benefit from the easement, from signing their property into a conservation easement that might kick them out of any future cost share deals like fencing fire anything like that. Is there anything obvious that stands out? So or is, is there anything that if you're in the carbon market, you tie you 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 get tied into a contract, will it affect you down the road? That's a really good question. And as we all know, they're in the process of writing a farm bill right now. So anything can change or anything is possible. But generally speaking as long as there's not a federal tie, as long as we don't have a federal nexus, if the carbon credits aren't somehow funded federally, generally we can still do uh, some conservation work through those, generally speaking. Uh, and even then, if, if the carbon credits are, you know, to do some of those practices, we might even be able to help with some of those practices, uh, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, on tillage fields or brush management or whatever. And, and we are in a, a, a climate smart for or a practices. And so uh, that's something that we're, we're kind of dipping our toes in and really don't know much about it quite yet. But that, that is certainly an interesting question. And I don't think there would be anything that would keep you from from signing up. Uh, um, I will add on to that a little bit because I had I. There, briefly, I was getting a lot of carbon contract questions. Um, generally speaking, uh, yeah, a carbon contract is not going to knock you out of anything with us within our CS. However, I did actually get a copy of a carbon contract. I don't remember the exact wording. For disclaimer, hire a lawyer if you're talking about carbon contracts. But. Um, the statement within this contract was written generally enough that it might have, you know, it said something like landowner or operator agrees not to accept any other incentive for, you know, uh, carbon sequestration or whatever. But it was phrased generally enough that if the right lawyer got a hold of that, he would say, you're double dipping through the NRCS programs 
again, like carbon contract, just hire a lawyer. Um, so, and yeah, go into it with as much information as possible. Uh, cause it's a new thing. No, you know, no one knows hundred percent what's going to happen, but this, yeah, heads up. That's what I know. Other questions? You know, I may make it a, a more generalized comment. I know our focus over the last couple of days and tomorrow, you know, has been on quail. Um, but from our side of the perspective, you know, quail maybe not always be the opportunity that gets us in the gate. And I think the advantage to having all these multiple partners is their their awareness of other opportunities you know habitat work is expensive you know mulching you know plant treatment spraying herbicide treatments and so on and so on the list is very long but having connectivity to partners such as you heard from today you know you may know somebody you may have an interest in monarch butterflies you may have an interest in houston toads texas horn lizards you know you pick the the non-consumptive wildlife that that you may have an interest in and in this day and age there's lots of money tied to things that we just don't you know try and chase around with our shotguns so keep that in mind i guess that's another value to a variety of partnerships and having the awareness of the folks because there's lots of people that have money to contribute to habitat management your goal may be for quail management but Derek may very well have some money for monarch work or something like that. So don't don't limit yourself to just thinking quail, think all good things on the landscape, because I guarantee you, if you have a property that has horny toads on it, it probably has quail too, or should have quail. So Okay, I guess I'm still ahead of schedule, so We'll uh, take a, just switch gears here and, and uh, get our next speaker up here and get ready to go. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, speakers, as well. So. So we're going to continue on with this uh, more tools for landowners theme, I think. And uh, the next speaker is also a Texas Parks and Wildlife employee. Uh, Mr. Will Newman is our Farm Bill coordinator. So we, we, we're we talking about all kinds of federal programs, different opportunities and stuff like that. But Will is, is a great liaison for Texas Parks and Wildlife to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He uses his perspective as a grassland ecologist and private lands biologist to ensure that technical and financial assistance programs are available to provide resources to assist private landowners to best manage for quail and other wildlife, you know, have been our theme, you know, all afternoon. So I think we'll have some great ideas and, and even have some pretty pictures to share with you. So thank you, John. Yeah. Um, so farm bill coordinator liaison to USDA, uh, those are pretty ambiguous in some ways, but uh, I'd like to point out, I got a lot of friends and mentors in this room and I come, I'm part of the quail tribe. So I'm a quail biologist first uh, and I'm a policy person second. Uh, and I carry my passion for, for this group and, and the things we hold together into policy and representing the, our viewpoints and priorities in every meeting and, and discussion that we have, every policy document we put out. Uh, so I just wanted to thank this room for the support that you guys give us. Uh, and I, I wanna point out that, that the investment in my position by Texas Parks and Wildlife is unique. There's not a lot of states that uh, put that much priority 
and making sure that private landowners are empowered through these massive resources through the federal government to make sure uh, that wildlife priorities are represented there. Uh, and so it directly benefits the folks in this room. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go here. Uh, so <clears throat> again, Bob White Quail kind of reference frame everything that, that I look at. So every time I go into a discussion, I'm thinking like a quail as much as possible uh, and trying to figure out how I can uh, turn these resources into quail habitat to stabilize quail populations in Texas. Uh, a lot of times that results in us making uh, influence on policy uh, in other places that impacts a lot of other states. So uh, folks are benefiting from the work that, that you guys initiate here and empower us to do at several different levels. So. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for quail on, on the left-hand side here, uh, and I know the best way for us to get there is by making more what's on that right-hand right, right -hand picture. Uh, good native grassland habitat, uh, and that's what I'm thinking about. When we do that, like others have said, uh, we get multi-species benefits. And the best way for us to restore quail habitat is not to find some special way just to farm for quail, but to stabilize in the environment. Native, na uh, Mother Nature has, has done the hard work for us. She figured out the best plants to grow where, in what soil types, in what climate, and how to best manage those things with fire and herbivores. And all those things were in place long before we started disturbing that system. And so planting different grasses that are from somewhere else in order to uh, boost those populations of anything becomes farming. And that's not bad if we're talking about livestock. Uh, if we're talking about quail, maybe the easiest, most passive way for us to manage large scale habitat across a landscape that's affordable and practical for landowners to apply so that all of us reap those benefits is to restore the native ecology of a system and play in to what should be there already. Uh, and so with, with that in mind, I want to I want to just throw this uh, chart back up. I think John McLaughlin showed it earlier. This is crazy. It's disheartening. Uh, just since 1970, 53% loss of grassland birds. Um, it's alarming. I know our, our populations are down a huge amount in that same amount of time for bobwhites. I wanted to point out that, again, reinforce what John said earlier, that, that this is not happening in a vacuum. Uh, that bobwhites are not the only species, it's just the one that we're paying most attention to in this room. But it's happening to all grassland birds at a very similar and alarming rate. Uh, so whatever we do for bobwhites is going to help these other things, and if I can pull partnerships together because they care more about meadowlarks than bobwhites, we're going to use their resources. So we also know that, that, that landscape connectivity and quality of habitat is probably the biggest driver uh, for the sustainability uh, of the bobwhite populations we're concerned with. We also know why that's declining. Uh, that decline has to do with land use uh, and the decisions that we make uh, as landowners or uh, land managers or ag producers on the landscape, uh, the urban uh, sprawl, the development that occurs that changes that natural system in some ways destabilizes uh, how, how stable uh, those populations are. Uh, we're removing pieces of the insulation of the habitat that allow these animals animals to survive uh, and thrive under, under natural conditions. So I, I want to point out my little bullet here. There's no morals or ethical statements involved with agriculture here. Uh, these diagrams aren't saying what's right or wrong. I just want to point out that if we have to make intentional decisions about the outcomes we're looking for. So if your priority number one is producing pounds of beef per acre, then your decision is going to be a little different, at least, from someone whose priority number one is growing quail. Uh, and so I would also contend that there's a broad spectrum in between those two goals where you can do both. Uh, and so 
you have to make intentional decisions about your priorities. So if you choose to graze one more animal, you're prioritizing maybe you know, the profit that you get from that production. If you choose uh, to defer and maybe not graze as much because you wanna make sure you have enough habitat for quail, uh, you know, you're making that decision with your quail priority in mind. And so we have to be intentional about those decisions. And the only way we can be intentional is if we're well informed and we have access to that information and support and we have resources to help us accomplish it. Uh, there are very few landowners who uh, can do the amount of work we're talking about on a regular basis on their own. So if we break that into different land use types, uh, in rangeland, it's a little, should be a little more compatible with native wildlife habitat. Uh, native rangeland and grazing, uh, forage production on native rangeland is really uh, the harvesting of surplus plant material uh, for the production of that agricultural product or livestock. And so if we manage how much of that we take, we can make sure that we're having a positive impact and certainly not a negative impact on the quality of the wildlife habitat uh, and the species that depend on that, that same rangeland. It's a little easier to manage. It's just a management decision. Pasture and hayland, it's a little bit different. It's a more intense form of agriculture. So we're moving more to the right as you go uh, for pasture and rangeland. More intense, more inputs, more intense management, simplification of the plant community reduces your diversity of the animals and the insects and the, the plant diversity drives insect abundance and diversity and that drives bird populations including bobwhite quail. So pasture and hay, we, if we're making a decision to convert rangeland to hayland or pasture, we're intentionally making a decision to prioritize forage production over the, the wildlife habitat that would be there other than things that will use a pasture like occasional use by deer and coyotes and skunks and raccoons, but those generalist species that get along. Uh, but more selective species like grassland birds and especially bobwhite quail, they're not going to find what they need in those, in those situations. Situations. Cropland is pretty similar, uh, maybe even more, it's certainly more intense, but there are opportunities for wildlife habitat and creating quail habitat in a cropland landscape. So if, you if we're in an area where cropland is, is prevalent, we can use uh, certain conservation tools and practices to make sure that we have some connectivity of those rangeland sites across the cropland, give some migration uh, and travel corridors for, uh, for wildlife uh, and provide food and nesting cover as well. It's not as good as if it was all usable habitat, but at a certain point, uh, uh, like was pointed out with uh, pheasants in the Midwest uh, and programs like CRP, we can implement buffers and field borders and filter strips and even blocks of habitat by removing less productive acres from production and putting them into conservation cover that provides wildlife habitat. <laughs> Again, so success and provision of wildlife habitat and specifically quail habitat requires that intentional decision making. And if you're not thinking about uh, the outcomes for quail when you're making these decisions, then you're prioritizing something else. Uh, so assistance is available and you should definitely consider using it or we lose some of those resources. So here's a picture of what a grazing scenario uh, might look like in this area and further north. Uh, I got this, I use this diagram uh, from my friend Matt Mahachek with NRCS. Uh, he's a grazing specialist with them. Um, so over on the left-hand side, we have a more in indication of, uh, of what a native grassland system might look like. This would have been maintained with a uh, regular occurrence of fire, either set uh, intentionally or otherwise, and a light and seasonally rotated through grazing impact uh, on, from herbivores, originally bison, uh, and now uh, livestock cattle. Uh, so we can maintain that system and the high quality of that wildlife habitat and that quail habitat specifically by just tweaking and making a decision. It's a management attitude, a philosophy that you adopt, uh, a set of rules that you use to dictate your land use. It's pretty hands off. <laughs> Typically, often, there's not a lot of upfront or continually co continual costs with adopting this kind of management system. If you have good conditions 
and you don't over overuse them, uh, you can make management decisions. The only thing that you give up is maybe a little potential for short-term gains that could be higher if you overutilized. But certainly I would contend you're, you're creating a sustainable long-term productivity that you would sacrifice if you overutilize the system. So this little ball in the, in the dips here represent the amount of effort it takes to maintain that condition or to move back to, towards the left and restore those high quality habitat conditions. So if you move that ball down a hill, it's a little harder to push it back up. So if we move further to the right, maybe we overgrazed a little too much, we had a few, uh, few extra head, didn't get the rain we expect, or we have an extreme drought or some other condition, uh, un destabilizes our, our normal plan of action. And we weren't prepared uh, to adapt to that plan then maybe we have to do a little extra work to get us back into that high quality. In this case, we might have to rotate cows out. We might have to uh, do some other incidental management in response to the conditions that we created with our decision. If you move a little bit further, and I would contend that, that much of this region is somewhere between those two middle conditions, uh, and that the worst is further to the right, and, and a very small handfuls of, of producers keep us over on the left. Uh, for most folks, uh, if you have native rangeland that's not planted into something else or not sprayed regularly for herbicide, you know, herbicide treatments on uh, for weeds and others, and you just have a slightly overutilized condition, we're, we're just talking about we're still at a point where we can recover it with some management decisions and a little bit of, of resources applied. As we move to the right, though, it's going to cost a whole lot more. So there's a scale here from maybe making more money by managing it correctly on the left to spending a lot of money to take a restorative action and hope uh, that we can get it somewhere back to close to what the system should be. And, and Dr. Hernandez pointed out that it's really an alternate state. It's not a linear thing like we're describing here. Uh, in some cases, we've completely deviated the plant com community away from what it should be and we're on a different track and and at that point we have to bring it back as best we can to approximate what should be there and that's uh, if we get all the way to the right that's what we're looking at so where do we start where do we get that information that I said you needed in order to make these good decisions so luckily uh, for the last 120 years or so uh, the USDA has been collecting extensive soil data and productivity data on those soils uh, they've been mapping these soils and putting together Together, this database of different factors that really determine the plant communities that can grow in certain soil types and certain geographic locations and climates and that information uh, has been more recently made available and utilized in conservation planning through a tool and a website called the Web Soil Survey. And on your phones, there's an app called Soil Web, and it's really neat. You can drop a, a pin with a GPS and it'll tell you exactly what you're standing on soil wise. It's, it's a starting point it's usually pretty correct, it's not, a, it's not perfect, but it'll tell you relatively what type of soil you're standing on, what type of plants should grow there, uh, how many pounds of forage typically grow on that soil type in that location on a good year, a bad year, or somewhere in between. Uh, so all that data has continued to grow and grow. Uh, and with the growth of that data, we've been able to lump certain soil types together into ecological sites or major land uh, resource areas. And these areas are determined by things that, uh, soil types uh, in, in plant communities that could be managed in a similar way. Or if we apply a certain action, they respond in a predictable manner. Uh, and so by putting these tools together, we can really map it. We can uh, show descriptive pictures of the historic condition of those plant communities. And then we can take another step and develop these what are called uh, state transition models. So uh, in the top left there uh, on this particular side it was a savanna uh, with tall grass and oak trees uh, and so in that in the optimal historic condition uh, with a normal uh, disturbance from mother nature uh, it was maintained in this case as a as a savanna tall grass system but 
if given a disturbance or a lack of disturbance, uh, uh, overutilization by us, we transition from that condition, that plant community into other plant communities that uh, then we can apply this model to tell us how to get back to that ecological site that should be uh, in that location. So these models are really helpful, but all this is sort of a little heady. It's a little high up there. Um, as we add more and more data, uh, you need to be more of a uh, somebody, a grassland ecologist to really look at this or a grazing specialist. Uh, and so if you're not a livestock manager and you're a landowner trying to make sure that the person leasing your rangeland for grazing is making good decisions, this is a little unapproachable uh, and you need help. And that's where the agencies and programs come in, but also as time has gone on, we've developed new tools that use all that information and combine it with some other resources. So uh, the rangeland analysis platform I'm going to way oversimplify this tool. It's really complicated in a really fantastic way, but the range analysis platform uh, takes uh, long history at this point, since the 80s, we've had very reliable, high quality satellite imagery uh, across the entire continent. Uh, at, to such high quality in such a degree that we can compare year to year, pixel by pixel on that image to determine what type of plant cover exists on a particular location. And we can then compare each of those images to each other uh, year by year to see how it has changed. We can pinpoint when a fire has taken place. We can pinpoint, uh, identify acres that were transitioned from native rangeland into cropland. Uh, we can see brush management occurring on the landscape uh, with this tool. And so the initial uh, initiative here uh, for the rangeland analysis platform was to track and identify that woody encroachment that John McLaughlin talked about earlier today. Uh, and I'm going to show a very similar map uh, <clears throat> that came off of this tool. This is provided, uh, put together by the Prairie Project. Uh, using the range analysis platform. So that comparative satellite imagery, that remote sensing data, all put in together, and this shows the two extremes of that data set, uh, 1984 to 2019, just take another look at that and, and imagine, uh, you know, the impact that that has. That is a significant transition from one or completely herbaceous grassland community over much of the state to a shrubland or even a woodland uh, at this point. So if you can imagine how the how the functionality of that habitat for a quail uh, or any other species might change how much how stable their population can be, how resilient they are to all of the other factors that might kill a quail. You, you've really destabilized uh, where they want to be and the factors in the habitat that support them. Um, I will also contend that uh, most, most folks that you talk to don't see this change has happened. Uh, our memories are flawed in very short term and uh, we will convince ourselves that it is the same thing that we've always looked at for 30 years. Uh, but this type of tool gives us a way to really visualize that change on the landscape. Uh, you can zoom into a pretty tight scale. I believe the pixels are 30 meter pixels. So if you have more than 30, you know, 30 uh, square meters uh, on your ranch, you can take a look at how the plant community has changed. Um, this, this image tracks uh, brush encroachment, woody brush encroachment. There are other, th there are other f uh, switches you can flip in this tool to uh, show the difference between annual grasses and perennial grasses, native vegetation versus non-native vegetation. They have different reflectivity and they show up differently in the image and the, uh, the program can detect those changes. Uh, in other parts of the country, uh, in the Northern Great Plains, uh, annual, exotic annual grasses have taken over large landscapes. This is Heat grass, uh, and that represents a huge fire hazard, also a major change in the plant community. And th this tool is also used to track uh, the aggressive spreading of cheat grass in that landscape, as well as the woody encroachment. So uh, just, just a few ways that, that these tools are, uh, are helping us out. Now, when you, when you think about that I can use satellite imagery to identify changes in the plant community, and we also have this other data set that can tell me what plants grow somewhere and how much they grow under certain conditions. And I can compare year to year. 
somebody smarter than I am put together, put one and one together and made two and we now have the production explorer. Uh, the production explorer is incredible. Uh, this is a game changer for range management on the whole, uh, but it works. You zoom in, you identify a focal area. This could be your whole ranch. It could be a wildlife management area. It could be one pasture in your ranch. Uh, and you can outline that parcel and run an analysis on one location. There is a kind of a minimum scale. It's more powerful at larger scale than smaller scale. But in my opinion, if you have more than a couple hundred acres, it's very accurate. Um, in less than that, it's still useful. It's a, it's a guiding post. None of, this, uh, none of these tools supplant on the ground experience, the eyeball test by an experienced manager who understands your outcomes that you're looking for and your priorities. Uh, the NRCS range management specialists, the, some of the Quail Forever folks are extremely talented uh, in range management uh, and grazing uh, plans, but this is a starting point. This is a way for you to independently fact check what's going on and what you can expect and what you should expect uh, from the plant community on the acres that you're making decisions on. So just, and don't trust yourself as much as you don't trust anybody else. Look at this data first and then form an opinion. Even if you're an experienced producer who's been on the same land for a long time, it's pretty eye-opening to see how much forage you could be producing and how much was produced in the past compared to the impact that you're having now. Um, and so uh, by just drawing a polygon on this map uh, and setting a range of dates uh, and going through a couple other steps, you can input data like how big your cows are and how many days out of the year you're gonna graze them. And it calculates in all of their nutritional requirements and because you set that range of dates, it uses that satellite imagery to, to tell you how much forage you produce, you actually produced over that last period of time. We can't make decisions about what we were should have done five years ago, but we can let the outcomes of those decisions tell us what we might do in the future uh, and better inform your decision making about how you utilize that landscape. So I, I realize not everybody in the room has control over those decisions and, and we'll get to more about that. But, but if you do, if you're a decision maker on acres and you didn't have this information before, know that these tools are available and not only tools that you can check and get some idea for yourself and then start talking to folks, that'd be, that'd be the next step, build a team of folks that can provide really good information for you. And as never before, as we just talked about with this partnership uh, panel that was up here earlier, uh, the amount of resources that are available now to help private landowners make good and better stewardship decisions that are compatible with quail. And I'll tell you everybody, everybody I know, uh, it considers quail a top priority uh, that deals with land management uh, in these circles. This, is, this group of folks is down on the, the mid Gulf Coast area, uh, just a, a smattering of folks. There's Matt, Mato Matt, Matt Mahachek from NRCS that I mentioned earlier, uh, some Parks and Wildlife folks, Quail Forever folks, Gary Stevens from Wildlife Habitat Federation is on here. Uh, all these folks are available free to advise you on wildlife habitat, uh, in, you know, decision making. They can help you come up with your goals and set your priorities if you don't already know what they are. And then they can help you reach those goals. We all have our strengths and weaknesses, and we know that. Uh, I think John mentioned it uh, just, just earlier, that if one of us doesn't know the answer to your question, we certainly know who to ask. Uh, and we can, we can find the best way to, to reach resources and, and guidance that you need to make good decisions. So once you build your team, you make your final decisions on what your goals are, and then start working on how you accomplish those goals. So step one there is, is reaching out, finding your team. Uh, I'll put up two examples here. Uh, certainly Thomas and the Quill Forever people are available in other groups, uh, Gary with Wildlife Habitat Federation, but for Texas Parks and Wildlife, a wide range of responsibilities. Certainly our district biologists are not only focused on doing habitat projects for private landowners. We have a lot of other responsibilities uh, in our divisions, uh, in our districts. But 
they are available for those consultations. And they're usually the best first step. If your priorities are wildlife minded, especially quail is a priority, you should reach out to your local district biologist. You find that person, the best way to do it, I won't put a website up there, no one ever writes that stuff down or follows it, so it sounds dumb, but just Google TPWD, find a biologist. I promise it's the first link. You'll see this page with the map of Texas. All of these districts and regions are about to change, uh, but they'll be updated on the website uh, but for now you click on the region where your county is select your county I'm gonna throw Annalise under the bus and put her information up here uh, but this is Taylor County here so it shows you your local folks their supervisors those resources those personnel resources that are available from a wildlife perspective immediately and if these folks don't have the expertise to help you reach your goals they know the partners and contacts that do the other avenue is if your priorities are more about ag production or you have wildlife and ag or you're just more f familiar or comfortable working with USDA than Texas Parks and Wildlife, uh, then it's just as easy to find their folks. Uh, a quick Google search of your county name plus USDA Service Center uh, will give you uh, the contact information. In most cases, it'll give you a Google map pin and tell you right where the office is. But if you Google search uh, Service Center located, you'll get this map here you select your part of Texas pulls up the county uh, and that gives you the contact information for NRCS and Farm Service Agency so uh, Manuel was up here earlier uh, and gave, gave you guys a rundown of some of NRCS's programs. I want to take a second to tell you guys how lucky we are to have Manuel daily on. So uh, we've had, uh, Manuel's been in his position not too long, but we've had extraordinary success and progress on wildlife issues since he's taken his position. Uh, and I couldn't be happier to be working with Manuel on a regular basis on these programs and others. Uh, we have a really valuable resource there. And the team of zone biologists that cover different parts of the state are equally as qualified and passionate about what the things we care about in this room. We have advocates within USDA at the local level that are really trying to move the needle and they're great partners for us uh, and they facilitate a lot of this stuff happening. So I uh, really appreciate their, their work there. So the regional conservation partnerships uh, are a way to bring the decision-making and prioritization of outcomes of these huge federal dollars to partners. Right now, we're engaging on that in every way possible, both directly as Texas Parks and Wildlife, supporting positions and partnerships with NGOs like Quail Forever and American Bird Conservancy and dozens and dozens of other groups, uh, but also uh, easement holders and uh, land trust organizations to gain more resources and bring them into the state. That's the goal. We have to get more and more resources into the state. This is a huge job and we can't even accomplish it with what we have right now. So, well, so um, RCBP is an important way to bring extra stuff in. If we just talk about EQIP, which is the biggest hammer in the toolbox, um, Manuel mentioned we spent, I think it was $86 million last year. That's a little understatement. In the past, uh, in the very recent past, we spent between 100 and $120 million in the state. And that's extraordinarily higher than most other states. Uh, so we get a lot of resources through EQIP. Not all of them are wildlife compatible, but the more active this group is uh, and the more partnerships we build, the more we change the, the status quo on wildlife compatibility with the outcomes of these programs and resources. One of the ways we did that uh, and are doing that is with that Working Lands for Wildlife project that was talked about earlier. This map of Texas on here, don't take too much stock in it. This program is just EQIP. So it's available statewide. The, the dots on this map represent where uh, folks are available and stationed and those are their priority counties. But like Thomas said, they're available to go anywhere in the state and help folks work on these programs. The Bob White Working Lands for Wildlife Project brings attention and marketing and momentum and resources together for Bob White Quail. And I know a lot of groups and people that are represented here helped us sign petitions and letters to get this to happen. Uh, and that was about two years ago, two and a half years ago. So it's not an end all be all, but it's momentum. It's dedicated resources. It's attention for Bob Whites on a national scale. And we're playing a big role in Texas. 
Another thing that was mentioned earlier is CRP or the Conservation Reserve Program. There's a lot of forms of CRP. There's a lot of programmatic stuff. I'm not going to beat you guys up with that stuff. But I'll tell you that we've had a, a project. It's a State Acres for Wildlife Enhancement Project, SAFE. We've always had one in the panhandle for prairie chickens. It was successful to some extent. We're starting to lose some of those acres uh, right now as prairie chickens are being listed and that habitat is more critical than ever. All that habitat is quail habitat. Uh, so if we lose CRP, we lose, we lose quail habitat. It's one to one. Whether you care about prairie chickens, you're concerned about prairie chickens or not, leave the politics out of it. It's affecting quail populations as well. So it's really important that we have access to that version of CRP, that, that the conservation funding and the farm bill is robust. But we've had the recent opportunity to build out this program and expand it. And we did that with a quail person with some influence on how the program got designed. We expanded this into the Western Rolling Plains and throughout the entire panhandle to make sure that we had a program available for cropland acres in the panhandle. So again, it's pretty specific to cropland. If you don't have a, a, a recent cropping history of row crops, you're probably not gonna qualify. It's not gonna be a good fit for you. But all the red, yellow, and orange that Fidel uh, Hernandez pointed out earlier on this cropland data layer, uh, are cropland acres. These are all acres in production right now. It's all, most, most of that red is in cotton. As much as I love cotton, uh, it's not good quail habitat. Uh, if I can get folks to put borders and buffers that connect good quail habitat through this cropland, we have a much more resilient quail population. Uh, we might even be able to bolster some quail populations with this kind of habitat work if the quality is high enough. In the past, the, the, the habitat quality was good, usable, marginal, uh, and with, with time, it becomes less, uh, less impactful. So along with the expansion of that project, Manuel and I worked together with some others to develop a, a planning manual uh, that is specific to result in ecologically appropriate grassland cover. And I guarantee you all this is excellent bobwhite quail habitat and scale quail habitat. As much as I can make it, that's what we've got. So we have specific technical guidance, county by county, soil type by soil type, to make sure the right types of seeds. We, we consulted with the Texas Native Seed Program and a bunch of the other seed vendors about what is commercially available, what we're able to plant out there. Old CRP that's expiring has the opportunity to enroll into this program and they get paid 100% of the cost share to improve those acres for the, all the acres. This is a major change in that program. So if folks have an old, old enrollment of this program, an old contract that is now kind of converted to exotic grasses or is degraded in quality, they have the opportunity for cost share to improve this program, uh, to improve the quality of those acres. So uh, wrapping up, a little homework. Uh, if you're a decision maker, or you can influence a decision maker, uh, to quote Dale there, um, build a team of advisors people that you trust that are well informed pick and choose from them play favorites shop around whatever you got to do extension uh, service usda your texas parks and wildlife biologists if you got quill forever folks or other ngo folks that you trust you have a good uh, person who's like-minded about your goals and is willing to support what your outcomes that you that you're determining uh, build that team and trust them trust their opinion uh, take their guidance into into effect and then find out what tools and programs are available to help you uh, and use them um, we have that we're in the land of riches right now with resources from the national scale uh, both usda and fish and wildlife service resources we got a lot of funding that we're struggling to figure out how to spend it effectively and make sure that we do the good that we know we can get out of these programs doesn't matter why or politically how it happens we can make good quail habitat out of these resources if we make that intentional decision. If landowners and decision makers don't utilize these resources, they're gonna go away, they're gonna get spent, but they're gonna get spent in ways that are not compatible with quail. Uh, so everybody in this room needs to know about this and, and be pushing that these programs are available. I know it's boring to talk about the programs, but like it's something we have to engage in. If you're eligible to engage in these programs, at least make contact with the program. You may not need financial assistance. You may not need the technical guidance, 
but at least make a contact with these folks that are on the landscape um, to, to roll these dollars out. It, it ensures that we'll have more resources later. Uh, also, understand where that funding comes from. Your hunting and fishing license sales are important for standing up the state wildlife agency uh, in, in ways that are far reaching beyond individual people's salaries or where, where the money goes here and there. But all the money that, that runs through there is leveraged at an in, incredible amount to claim federal dollars from Fish and Wildlife Service and especially USDA. If we wanna impact acres on private land that's behind the gate, that Everyone in here doesn't get a say in how, whether they're quail habitat or not. If we wanna impact the folks that are available to give guidance on those acres, we have to invest in positions. We have to invest in habitat programs to help those private landowners make good decisions and get the work done. It's too big of a hill to climb to expect those folks to, to pay for it all themselves. And we all reap the benefits. There's not, there's likely not anybody in here that has a habitat parcel that you own and completely control uh, that has a sustainable population of quail that'll last indefinitely. We all rely on our neighbors uh, to build a landscape of habitat to make a sustainable quail population. By doing all that, we ensure more resources in the future. So again, Farm Bill is important. It results in the funding for all these tools. It, it pays for the partnerships, the seed money that we leverage state dollars with in order to put bodies on the ground to talk to landowners to make important decisions about their land and it provides the resources to get that work done. This is all the conservation for private lands. I mean, this is, this is, it's what we're talking about. It has to happen on private lands. We do the best job we can with wildlife management areas and public acres. And we say, we like to say 95% of Texas is privately owned. Well, 95 might be privately owned, but that doesn't mean we have 5% that's, you know, wonderful quail habitat across the state. We don't control a huge portion of that 5%. It's other things, Army Corps of Engineers or uh, you know, national forests that have multiple use purposes. We, don't, we can't make it all quail habitat. So we really have control over a very small percentage of the acres in the state, and that's not enough to have quail, uh, stable quail populations, and certainly not enough to have them in parts of the state where that land doesn't exist. So we gotta go to where the land does exist, and that's on private lands. So farm bill is important. Uh, I would I would ask each of you to think about it, to understand where these resources come from and the good that they can do for quail, and to make sure that your elected officials understand how you feel about that. I'm not telling you how to vote one way or another or advocating policy in one way or another, but it's important to quail habitat, and if you feel strongly about that, your, educate, your elected official, officials need to know that. It's especially poignant right now. Uh, the Farm Bill is being legislated. It is politically, it's turmoil right now. There's a lot of the conservation funding in the Farm Bill is at extreme risk um, from all different directions. They're looking for ways to pay for things that don't result in quail habitat. Uh, it's a small portion anyway of the Farm Bill. We've got to defend it, and the only way that happens is if elected officials hear that it's important from you. One other little tidbit, just one of many marker bills that will eventually uh, weigh into the end in statutory language of the farm bill itself. Uh, one that I really like, I think is really popular on both sides of the aisle, has a lot of momentum, is the Voluntary Public Access Improvement Act. Um, voluntary Public Access uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, we have uh, uh, Will is, is out of, where's, where's Will out of Granbury, I think, but uh, works with Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, to help enroll landowners into this program. It's a small payment for access of the public to hunt on their land. We have a lot of acres in Texas in that program. It's extremely important for us. Nationally, that program right now is funded at $50 million. We do a lot of really good work with that. There's a lot of river access that we do, which is unique. Uh, so fishermen really get a lot out of that program as well. It's popular across the political spectrum. Uh, I expect not. I expect to gain ground on this one particular program. The, this act is proposing that they triple that budget. If they triple that budget and change some of the administrative rules, we can pay landowners a whole lot more, and and lock up even more access for 
on private land for public access. This is a common strategy in much of the Midwest. It was mentioned how South Dakota prioritizes their local geography uh, for pheasants and markets that. I think Joe mentioned that. Um, it's something we could do in, in Texas if we had access to a sufficient amount of the funds to open those gates. Um, so one, one particular piece of legislation you might be interested in talking to your elected officials about. But I'll wrap it up there, and I don't know if I have time for questions or not, or if anybody's interested in asking questions. But Questions for Will? I'm a resource available for anybody. So if you have questions about stuff, uh, let me know. I, I've got business cards I can give them to you. We have a lot of uh, partnerships that are engaging in some of these opportunities, uh, and I'm helping them through this process as well. So Parks and Wildlife makes the investment, but I'm available for, for any of our partners for, on this stuff. So. That's more of a comment than a question, but earlier in your presentation, you were talking about the regional analysis platform as well as other resources available to, to the public. Yeah. For me personally, using it both as a biologist and as a landowner, I've found it very useful the fact that you can see trends for the last 30 years. Yeah. And whether you've owned that piece of property or not, you can look back and say, hey, you know, what maybe caused this, this trend, uptick or downtick? Was it climate related? Was it a change in management practices, maybe stocking rates, et cetera? It's a great tool to be able to visually kind of see what that satellite imagery is estimating that forage production to be on an annual basis. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Thomas was saying, you know, the, the power of that range analysis platform in some ways, some of the coolest thing is is the longevity. Look, seeing what happened in the history. And Dr. Hernandez mentioned that that past impact. What happened here before uh, likely has an impact on what it is now and what it can be in the future. And, and this range analysis platform gives us a way to look back in time in an objective way. The image is the image. Uh, it's not it's not obstructed by our opinion or our faulty memory. Um, so it's it's a really powerful tool in some ways there. Anyone else? Thank you, Will. Thank you. Will always makes me smile because he has so much information. Sometimes it makes my head hurt, but he did take advantage of me being ahead of schedule. We're still a little bit ahead of schedule, and that's good. Um, I assume my next two speakers are in the room somewhere, Ben and Steve, and are, will be ready to go a little bit early as well. Um, I guess the only take-home message that I'm going to, you know, relate or share again, you know, from Will's comments and the comments for most of the afternoon again is uh, is just the opportunity. We're in the opportunity business. I don't care which side of the fence you're standing on. We're all in the opportunity business. There's lots of different uh, uh, service providers in this room from government agencies to universities to NGOs have opportunities for you. You as a landowner likely have opportunities on your property to, to do things different, maybe do things better. And I just encourage us all to uh, develop some type of relationship so we can explore those opportunities together and do better things for quail. So, um, so moving from all these technical conversations to what I'm going to consider a little bit more fun maybe some toys we're going to have a couple folks come up and talk to us about hunting gear and new technology everybody likes that kind of stuff um is ben available right there he's smiling so ben i hope i don't butcher this last name bredinger has a great job title that i would like to have wing shooting manager that's pretty cool you know um ben is is works for onyx and he hails from minnesota been chasing upland birds from the grouse woods of the Great Lakes to points across the country for many years through his travels and extensive use. He has developed many strategies on how to use the Onyx Hunt app to better help hunters find success behind their dogs and for many other different species. You know, it's a great product. We use it as an agency for our staff. <laughs> For our staff and I get the emails every day, lots of good information. So I'm excited to hear what Ben has to share with us. So Ben. Okay. Very good. You guys playing tricks on me, huh? Well,
Well, thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to talking with you today about Onyx Hunt. Just with a show of hands to start, um, who has used or has Onyx right now? Nice. I love it. Um, you know, I, I did see obviously a number of hands that haven't used it before. So I'll just give you a little bit of background and as well as some of the, the features that we've developed in the app, uh, features and also layers that can help you, um, you know, whether it's, it's be a better hunter or be a more successful land manager. Uh, the, the interesting thing about Texas is, is we were found out of Montana where there is an ample amount of public land. So we get it a lot where it's like, well, I hunt my, you know, my ranch, my farm. I don't need this tool. And, and when Steve comes up, I'll have him touch on it. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of uses for the app on private land um, to, to help really focus and create strategies and you know it's been been talked about before but year over year to help find trends and make you a more successful successful hunter so um onyx was founded in 2009 and if, if you guys remember the handheld gps's right now we have all got alphas and whatnot but uh handheld gps's were great uh, you could put the Onyx Hunt chip in there and you could see property lines. And that was a huge, a huge step forward in technology. You could see, make sure you're on the right lands. You can make sure you're on public lands. Um, but as st smartphones, you know, we all, almost all have one now. Uh, in 2013, we created the Onyx Hunt app. And now you have all that same power in your phone. You can auto update. Makes life a lot easier. So, um, <laughs> We have grown quite a bit since 2013. So uh, like I said, the crux of the mapping app was the private and public land layers. That That is the crux. That's what a lot of people use it for. Our motto is know where you stand. So that's a big deal. But since then, we have really added a lot to this to build a really robust tool for hunters all over the country. And we're gonna talk about some of those things today. So uh, layers is, a, another huge part, this is where all of the information lives on the app. Um, so again, we talked about private lands, public lands, as well as having, you know, if you travel to other states at all, or I think Texas actually has a walk-in program here as well. All of those, all of those layers will pop up on the map. They're color coordinated. You know, you know, which lands are which, uh, as well as uh, each state has a lot of unique layers uh, i think i saw it in texas like possible access layer um those are kind of scattered around the whole country for example i'm from minnesota so a little ways away from here and up in the north woods we have what's called it's called blandon paper company and they open up all of their land to hunters so that is not something that is considered it's not enrolled in walk-in, it's not considered public, um, but it opens up, I mean, they, they have three, 400,000 acres up in Northern Minnesota that they allow hunting on. And without, you know, an application like Onyx, you would never be able to find those types of layers. So each state is very unique. Uh, different states have game layers. I know, for example, Arizona has upland bird game layers, a uh, bunch of different stuff. So if you're going to travel out of state, I encourage you to go look at those different layers and, and help glean some of that knowledge. Uh, so content, this is, this is uh, the real you know, for a lot of private land people, this is where this app really excels. Um, so we're talking waypoints, we're talking tracks, you can draw lines, um, you can draw area shapes, for example, if you're planning food plots, if you're trying to conduct a prescribed burn and you want to see how much you want to burn, you can map all of this with the app. Um, going back to waypoints, so waypoints is a, a great tool that I use. If you would look at my Onyx account, I think I have like 5,600 waypoints in the app. It looks like a pink and purple polka dotted mess. But I have different strategies for how I use waypoints to track, you know, my hunting over time because my memory is absolutely terrible and I could come to a spot like two years later and be like, man, this looks like a great spot again. 
vice versa. I could show up there and be like, oh yeah, this is why I didn't hunt this spot. So I'm very diligent, diligent about uh, marking waypoints. So each person has their different system. A lot of people use different color coordination for different years. Like everything on this property in yellow is from 2015, purple is 16, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I use mine a little bit differently. I use it uh, when I'm scouting, I travel a fair amount to hunt. So for example, everything that I've scouted on the internet or on the Onyx app, is in yellow everything i have you know hunted and successfully found birds i put in blue and then if i've been to a spot and it doesn't look good then i will put it in black just so i have that knowledge uh, you can add photos in there you can add notes so i take a lot of notes um I, sh I can't say i mark all the birds i flush but it when i go to a property and i've hunted a property you know year over year over year and i do end up putting a lot of waypoints on you know for example each covey i've found it's really interesting to take a look at that especially when you get five six years of data and just to see whether it's like okay i wonder if this is a similar covey but you can really glean a lot of insight that you can then scale to a different property or if you're hunting you're on a trip then you can find other pieces of property that have those similar features uh, and then this is another this is another fun thing that we launched a year or so ago i don't know if any of you guys have done it before where you're trying to share a waypoint with a buddy you're going on a hunting trip and all of a sudden all right, i'm going to share this waypoint this waypoint this one and before you know it, you have a text message string that's like 50 50 messages long and you're like man did i add this one didn't i add this one um so we we've, we've simplified that and created folders so for example you you've got a lease and you've got a buddy that's going to come out to hunt and you guys might split up right and one guy goes this way one guy goes that way but he doesn't know the ranch so what i can do is you know uh, i can go drive all the roads mark them in tracks then you can go name that road um, you can mark where all the for example water holes are maybe where the house is where we're going to meet up i can put that all into a folder and i can call it whatever quail camp and then before the hunt i can go share that to that friend so then he has all that information too and he can be self-sufficient you know if something happens he can get back to the truck or whatever um, and he knows the plan so that's an easy thing to do um, and again these these tools are they're pretty endless um, another cool one that we released is is compass mode so compass mode is uh if essentially if you in the bottom right corner there is a triangle but down there and when you tap it twice a blue pretty much uh angle comes up on the map like this so everywhere you face that is the map will orient course up versus north up and then on top of that we've added distance to that so for example you click it a third time and then you get a, a line that with, with distance measurement. So it's like, all right, how long do I have to go to find the truck? I can say, okay, the truck is this direction and it is 500 yards away. So just little simple things like that to help make your life easier. And again, this is, you know, we're talking, we're talking upland birds today, but this stuff is just as applicable for deer hunters, elk hunters, all of that stuff. <laughs> Uh, offline maps so if you guys haven't used offline maps a lot of areas don't have cell phone service or even worse that you have like one bar of lte so you barely have you have just a little bit of service but not enough to load maps not enough to really do anything so by downloading these maps you have pretty much the full power of your you know of the onyx app with you no matter if you have cell phone service so a lot of people don't know we get a lot of questions at onyx that are like well how does it how does my phone know where i am and and when i don't have cell phone services because your phone also has a gps unit which operates separately than cell phone service so pretty much you will always have gps service so you, you can show you where you are on the map um, and then you can have all this content available to you as well um, even when you don't have cell phone service uh, going back to layers a little bit um, we have we've started to implement a number of different things that um, 
and, and all of this, I'll, I'll kind of caveat with all of these things by themselves are pretty cool, right? Like, oh, it's like that's neat, that's neat, that's neat. But once you start combining a lot of these things together, that's when the power, like that's when it really becomes unlocked. Um, and you're you're traveling out of state or you're doing whatever to go hunt and it i mean it makes you dangerous right like b before when you're going to hunt a new area there's a couple ways you did it you had to know somebody or you had to know somebody that had gone out there before um and that's really otherwise like you're just maybe like steve and crazy and be like oh yeah i'm just gonna bah out here and figure it out for two weeks but nowadays it's like i want to go to idaho to hunt valley quail now it's like i feel like i can go scout on my onyx on my onyx app and and with reasonable certainty like i feel dangerous i feel like i can get into birds just about anywhere with the resources available on the internet um it can make it pretty dangerous out there so this is one of those layers that that it can help shorten that learning curve you're going to a new area for the first time to really help hone in on it so um for example we have like historic wildfires so if you go look in the app, you can see, I think it's back to like 2000. I think we have in there like 2000 and on for historic wildfires. So you can find areas that have burned. Obviously that's, that's very important in the mountains, but for upland birds, obviously disturbance creatures. So you can go and look and which areas of burn, like you're looking at a lease. Okay. This area burned in 2011. This one burned in 2018. It's all right there for you. Uh, crop distribution as well. So you can see, I think we have like 20 or 18 different species of crops. And obviously that is one year behind. So with a basic understanding of crop rotation in that area, you can kind of pinpoint what's going to be planted in there. For example, you're going out to Kansas. Uh, okay. This, this uh, walk-in or we area has got corn or soybeans adjacent to it let's just say this year it's their last year this year the map is showing there's beans there well there's a pretty good chance that that's going to be corn so i'm going there early or early in the year ah, that corn is probably going to be standing you might not want to hunt that one or i'm going later in the year we're going to want to find corn um so that allows you to do it all from the comfort of your home versus having to spend a bunch of time driving around to find that uh so another thing we added is is through lidar data uh we call it it's our, our tree data so you can essentially see what type of tree is on the landscape so we i mean we've we've generalized we've broke it down into groups a little bit but uh, i'm a grouse hunter for example it is nice to be able to see okay this is an aspen tree this is an aspen grove or i'm looking for oak trees to go deer hunt i can see okay these are these are oak trees or as far as like these are mass producing oaks so essentially oaks of a certain age that are more likely to produce a mass crop um, deciduous coniferous so if i'm going to scroll on a landscape i can flip that on and i can see okay this is all pines but then there is this you know finger of cot or this is a finger of of oak trees or deciduous trees running through there um, and again by putting all these things together it can i mean that's where the power really comes from um, current conditions you've got we've got our active wildfire layer you can see active burns going on we've got radar air quality with all the you know the interest in cwd we've got a lot of tools in there to you know to either to help see where where areas that are that have cwd as well as locate testing areas if that's something in your state so um yeah if you if you have any questions if you're unsure how to use the app you want to learn more about using the app i'll be around feel free to find me and and i'd be more than happy to answer your questions on on how to use the onyx hunt app so uh i will pass the microphone to steve Okay. Yeah. Just quickly, this is this is more just a comment. I think two really um, cool features of, of that. But when you take a waypoint, you can also attach a photograph to that waypoint um, for, for reference down the line and looking at historical things. 
um, and I know you all have just, um, I forget what, what the connections are called in your truck, but if you've got oh. uh, an iPhone, you can now plug it in directly to your truck and it'll pair with the GPS on your truck, so you're not having to follow your GPS on the truck and look at your phone at the same time trying to get to yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Ryan, Ryan was commenting on if you've got a, a truck that's got uh, in dash capabilities, you can plug it in or hook it up. You can now look at at it through uh, CarPlay. If you have Android, I'm sorry, we don't have Android yet. So just get an iPhone and don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, uh, the other thing, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention too is we just launched something called. Uh, uh, recent imagery so essentially that's it's a pretty dang cool feature so we will have satellite imagery that is less than two weeks old across the entire country less certain areas that are you know, cloud covered in clouds the whole time um, it's going to be a little bit lower resolution but uh, i've used it already we've only we've it's only been out for a couple weeks now but for example i'm going out to montana and i can see which pasture they have cows and not because i can see the cattle but i can see the trails like okay they've got cattle here it looks like this has been grazed down a little bit more or they have went and harvested this field so another tool that can help you be more successful while you're out hunting are you updating that every two yep every two weeks it's updated that's crazy yep across the whole country well, I appreciate it. Yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be around, so I'd love to chat on it. Go ahead. Go ahead. You want me to give you your nickel, nickel tour? That's okay. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ben. Lots of exciting technology for sure. So up next, Steve's carrying lots of toys, so this should be good as well. So Steve Snell is a partner in Gun Dog Supply, a hunting dog training supply business founded in 1972. He's an avid upland hunter, spending as much time in the field as possible with his bird dogs. Graduate of the 2015 Quail Masters and on the board of directors for Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation. So glad you're here. Thank you. <laughs> How y'all doing? I, uh, I I think I can note that that putting the bird dog guy in the last position, I'm not sure what that says. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I will say I think that bird dogs have been underrepresented today, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that before the next one. Um, how many of y'all are quail hunters? Might have been easier to say how many of y'all are not quail hunters. Um, I'm in the dog business, dog supply business, um, and I sell dog collars. And if you if you look, um, when, when you boil down what I do for a living, it has more to do with, with reconnecting lost dogs with their owners than almost anything else that I do. And we do that primarily through ID plates on tags. But nowadays we do that with GPS collars. Uh, my earliest memory of, uh, I, I'm going to say it's my first quail hunt. I was too little to carry a gun, but I got to go. And I clearly remember getting out of the truck and my father turning loose. He had one setter. Uh, her name was Bit and uh, only dog we had at the time. And I clearly I could see it right now. She, she gets out of the truck. He he gets his gun. She takes off. She goes over the hill. And my first thought is I will never see this dog again. <laughs> And, you know, um, I don't know how many folks appreciate GPS today, and I don't know if they clearly remember how much we dealt with before GPS in the how much time did you spend either looking for a dog, looking for your buddy's dog, or listening to your buddy yell <laughs> about where his dog is. You know, quail hunting can be much more pleasant today than it was in the past, strictly from the standpoint that I have a device that I can look at and it can tell me where my dog is and it can tell me what he's doing. Um, GPS tracking with dogs, just for a quick, if, if you're not familiar with it, um, dogs wearing a collar that is a GPS unit. You have a handheld that's a GPS unit. Um, a lot of people think that these units are communicating through satellites. That is not the case. Uh, G the way GPS works is the satellites are sending down information and the, the GPS receiver that you're holding is picking up that information from the satellites and then, then triangulating that and saying, okay, this is where you are. So the dog's GPS is, is saying, this is where you are. 
And mine is saying, this is where I am. And then those two units are communicating with each other via radio signal. So you have, you know, communication back and forth between the two. It is limited in range in that, you know, it's a radio signal. It can only go so far and it can't, you know, it can't, there's just limitations to the physics of radio signals. But for most bird hunters, that's generally not a problem. Um, and so that's really the basis of GPS tracking. It's been around since about 2007. We have had other technologies in the past. Um, uh, I saw a picture of Dr. Rollins' uh, uh, dogs earlier, and he had the giant beeper collars. Did, did anyone use beeper collars? Yeah, yeah, y'all miss those? Yeah, it's not like a garbage truck backing up. Um, so nowadays you can do a lot of things. I was having a conversation earlier with somebody about how, you know, being able to hunt silently and how much pressure, you know, birds are put under and whether or not they know you're there. And, you know, my ability to communicate with my dog and for me to know exactly where my dog is without having to say anything, is just it's just a gigantic deal. Um, Garmin has just released the current version of, of what they have. It's a product called the Alpha 300. Um, we have some other stuff that's on the market right now. One thing that's nice about the Alpha units is that uh, they are compatible with pretty much everything that Garmin has. So if you have a unit that you bought a few years ago, it's still going to work with the current stuff today. Um, the Alpha technology is a GPS handheld. It looks very similar to what you're used to when you think about a GPS in that it has a screen on it, has a map. You can see your dog. You can see which direction he's going in. Um, it also has a compass view. Um, personally, I find that the alphas are not what most bird dog folks are looking for. Um, they're popular with a lot of bird dog folks and they have some really cool features, but they're a little more complex than a lot of folks are looking for. Um, I personally use uh, the Garmin 550 Plus, which is a little bit more scaled down from the standpoint that it's going to tell it tells me the direction that my dog is in from me. It gives me an arrow. And it says he's how far he is away. He's 300 yards. And it tells me if he's on point or not. Let me back up a little bit. When, when I go to a dog that is on point, I always say to the people I'm hunting with, I've got a dog stopped. I don't say I've got a dog on point. You know, it's a, it's a motion sensor. And so it, it can say whether or not the dog's moving or whether or not he's standing still. You know, he could be constipated and you're going to get an indication that he is standing still. So you got to you got to keep that in mind um, for folks that that want that simpler product. Um, the, the 550 plus gives you that. Uh, but if you need maps, Garmin now has an app that you can use that communicates with that 550 plus. So you can actually see maps on your smartphone, um, you know, using that that 550 plus app. So you got some options. And, and the nice thing about these units is that it is an ecosystem that Garmin has developed and they work together. You know, if if I'm hunting with one of you and you have a, you know, an Alpha 300 and I'm hunting with somebody else that has an Alpha 200 and I have a 550 plus, we can still allow all of those products to communicate with each other if I want to know where your dogs are. Or let's say that we are hunting together and we lose a dog and we got to go pick him up, um, you know, I can, I can pull the information out of your handheld into mine so that I can track that dog. So th there's a lot of advantages to, to using those systems that, that work together. Um, another thing that, that I don't know if it's as important for folks in, in, in this part of the world. I hunt a good bit um, in Montana and, and a little further west. And uh, some of the Garmin Alpha units have a product that's called InReach. And so if you're looking at them, there's going to be a 300i or a 200i or a 300 or a 200. And so the, the i is the inReach uh, device. And basically that is satellite communication. And so my handheld, I can text um, without having cellular communication. I can send text messages. I can send locations. Um, it's a pretty handy thing if if you know, A, you hunt by yourself, or B, you hunt in places that don't have good cell signal. And then let's get let's do one more. Um, you know, I will tell my wife I'm going to Montana. Um, and that's about what she knows. And if something were to happen to me, you know, I mean, she might have a city to narrow it down to, but, you know, I'll get up some mornings and I won't know exactly where I'm going to hunt. It, a lot of it will depend on, you know, how I'm feeling. And you know, I can also drive to where I want to hunt. You're hunting public ground. Well, there's somebody, you know, there's a truck already parked there. Now you've got to move. Well, when I get to that next spot, I just press a button on my 
you know, on my alpha and it sends a signal to her that gives her a GPS pin. And so if for some reason I was to turn up missing, you know, it'd be a good place for There's a lot of things that work with, with the Garmin products. Um, they have watches so that if you want to track your dog on the watch, if you've got a buddy that wants to see that, there's uh, um, most of their watches will track dogs. The next part is, so, th so those are the handhelds. Then the next part is the collar. This is what your dog's wearing. Um, the current version of what we have is called a TT25, which that is a track and train model. And then we have a TT20, which is a track only pretty much works exactly the same. One has an e-collar functionality, one does not. Um, new collars, we have, COVID kind of set Garmin back a little bit. You know, these products use chips and I don't know how many of y'all experienced dealing with, with chip issues during COVID, but uh, we had to deal with some older technology for a while and they have just now released this new stuff and it's it's got a lot of really cool new features. Is Dr. Rollins here? Yeah. So when Dr. Rollins introduces me, he generally says, um, you know, Steve Snell, he's handy to have on a quail lease. I think it's got something to do with my shooting, but it's more about the fact that I can help you with your Garmin product. And so, and I do a lot of Garmin fixing for folks because they tend to be a little too complicated. And he always says, the first question he's going to ask you is, have you updated the software on your product? So GPS is a little more complicated than some things. They require new information. The other thing that I think a lot of folks don't understand is that Garmin doesn't control the GPS satellites. GPS satellites are government things. So things can change outside of Garmin's control and Garmin now has to update their product so that it works better. So you need to update the software on your gear for it to work best. Now, that's not something that most people are thinking about doing. It's just not something that most people are interested in doing until they have a problem. And so that, that's been a frustration since the product came out. Um, it's the, we now have a problem and okay, here's the software fix for it. But, uh, you know, if you don't update the software, there's nothing we can do to help you. So we have put in a, a Dale Rollins solution for this. Um, the new products, the, the 200, the 300, and the 25 collars, you can sync up with your Wi-Fi at your house. When you plug them up, at night to charge them. After they've been on charge for a few minutes, they're going to go online. They're going to check to see if there's a new software update. And if there is, they're going to install them for you. And they won't even, you know, you won't have to do anything. And so now I've become useless to Dr. Rollins. <laughs> and so, uh, but, but this is a big deal. Um, GPS collars are more complicated than most people are comfortable with. They, they don't realize not only the complexity of the product that we're dealing with and what it's doing, but we're also taking that product and we're putting it on an animal that does not care that you spent $350 on that collar. He does not care. And so you can't expect, you know, he's not going to care for it in a way that, that, that you would want him to. So, um, you know, it's one of those things that, uh, that, that having, we're, we're trying to get into a level now where the product is easier for the consumer to use, which is a, which is a gigantic deal. Um, I don't know too many folks that have, I still know a lot of folks that don't use GPS to track their dogs. They'll say they don't need it. Uh, maybe they've got close working dogs. Maybe they've never, never had a situation where they had a problem with a dog. Um, but I've never met anybody that started using GPS and stopped. You know, maybe they're frustrated with some of the stuff. Maybe they've had, you know, problems with it. Um, but I've never had a customer that, that it didn't change the way that they quail hunted and it didn't make it a better experience for them. And so uh, I, I'm a giant fan of the product. It, it takes an enormous amount of anxiety. You know, my dogs, um, you know, they're, a, they're an important part of, of what I do. I don't do any hunting that doesn't involve a dog. Um, you know, I've, I've never deer hunted. I've never turkey hunted. Um, I have no interest in, you know, in anything that, that's not dog related and, uh, keeping them safe and knowing where they are and knowing what they're doing is a huge deal for me. And, uh, it's, it's a wonderful product. Uh, be glad to talk to anybody about it. We do a lot of, of in-house service. If you have, you know, if you have questions, we can help you with it. Um, they are, they are complex, but not so much that, you know, that you can't figure out how to use them. And it, to me, it's really changed the way that I, uh, you know, the way that I, I hunt and, uh, and it just makes it a more enjoyable experience for me. So 
There you are. Yes, sir. Is there any program that Garmin's coming up with for a trade-in or upgrade? Um, Garmin, they, they don't do trade-in stuff. They do repairs. Um, some of the companies do will do trade-ins. So that is that is something that you can, you know, several folks do. Um, ben and I were going to talk a little bit about Onyx. Um, I, I talk about alphas and maps and, you know, you can do a lot of the things with a Garmin um, that you can do with Onyx. Um, you just can't do them as well. And so uh, um, I no longer we used to sell Onyx products when they had the chips and, you know, we would sell them with Garmin's and those days are over. Um, but I'm an Onyx user and uh, I would not use a the only time I use a Garmin for uh, for, try, you know, well, it's rare that I even even bother to put a waypoint in. Um, you know, because my Onyx does everything that I need. Um, and one other thing that, that, that I don't think we added when we were talking about Onyx, um, you know, you're talking about some of the features that it'll do. My favorite part about Onyx is that when I'm in the field, I can mark all of my stuff. Well, I got two things. When I'm in the field, I can mark all of my stuff. I can do my borders. I can mark birds, uh, you know, all sorts of things. Um, I, I was on a lease that has added some new crop fields and I was able to go in. They're not on the maps yet, but I was able to go in and, you know, and, and, and populate them. Um, but what I prefer about Onyx over anything else is that it speaks to my computer at home. So when I get home at night, all of the waypoints that I marked on my phone while I was out in the field are now on my computer. And you don't have to do anything. It automatically updates for you. Um, the other thing that's really cool about Onyx that, um, that not everybody sees it, you'll have people talk about, well, I, you know, this is my property. I own this property. I don't need that kind of information. I'm very familiar with this, this piece of ground. What I like about it is that if I'm on a piece of property and there's a problem Say you've got a hole in the fence. Uh, you've got a, you know, uh, you've got a problem on a on a levee. Um, so there's something real specific. Um, you can mark that point. You can take a picture, and then you can send that, you know, to the landowner. And for those of us that that you know, primarily I access land through the grace of other people that own that land. You know, being able to say to them, "Hey, there's a fence down right here, and here's the picture." Um, one of my landowners in Mississippi had a tree fall and take out one of his fences, but it was in a position where it was pretty good chance unless he just walked right by it, he wasn't going to see it. And I was able to mark it, take a photo, and send him that, and it it you know he's able to take that link and automatically pop it you know onto his Onyx. So. Uh, while I, I, I sell Garmin products and you can do some, some mapping things with them, uh, I'm an Onyx user. So, anybody got any questions? I'm standing between you on beer. So, you decided to go with the, forego the Alpha and go with the 550 and Onyx combined? Or? Well, to be totally honest with you, I run both. What's that? Great question. Well, the question is, 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 am I using a 550 plus and I'm using Onyx? And, in reality, I run a 550 plus and I run a 300 at the same time, which it's not something I recommend to my customers. Um, it's a little bit too much, but I don't use mapping on the alpha. I, I use the alpha primarily so that if I'm evaluating a young dog, I can look at a trail and I can say, OK, he, he did this. You know, what did he do at this point? And that's what I use the, the alpha for. I also use it for my in reach. You know, so I have the satellite communicator on it. So I use that. But if you forced me to only use one, I would use a 550 plus. You know, if it was a, you know, and, and I can, I can use the app to look at the map data if I want to. Yes, sir. Thank you for your video. Thank you. Thank you. My brother works very hard on me. He makes me look smart. But yes, thank you. We appreciate that. And I appreciate all the business, uh, the number of customers that I've met here. Um, I deeply appreciate, as do my bird dogs. They get to spend a lot of time in the field because of y'all, and I appreciate that. Today, yes, sir. As, and when, I've, I've interviewed Steve. He's on a podcast about a year or so ago with us, so I encourage all of us to have to have it. But we tend to think of Garmin and, and GPS collars and things about like four bird dogs. Mm. They're really a very small component of that GPS market. I'm going to disagree with that a little bit. Um, the, the, the original, the guy that developed the concept of it was a bird dog guy. Um, and the original product, if you look at it, is very bird dog specific, even to the point if you look at their marketing, it's very bird dog specific. In the grand scheme of things, uh, bird dogs are probably 25% of the market. 
Um, the hound market is actually, uh, you know, a substantially larger market. Um, I actually, about a year ago, I spoke at a foxhound convention, and uh, that's a whole different game. But you know, I've got three collars. You know, I typically will run two dogs at a time. You know, these guys are running a hundred dogs at a time. Every one of them's got a collar. So, you know, but we are an important part of the business. So, you know, but yes, we are. And a lot of times I'll have people that will come to me. Um, Garmin released the 300 very close to the release of the 200. You know, they really haven't been, the 200 hadn't been out that long and they released 300. And there were a couple of reasons for that and, and, and all that. But a lot of people would come to me and say, hey, you know, should I upgrade from this 200 to 300? And I can give you a couple of reasons to do it. But if you're a bird dog guy, I'd probably say no, you know, because the majority of the changes that were made into the product were made for the hound market. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, um, you know, they, they do, you know, and the 550 plus is a prime example of that, which I believe is what you're still running there. Is am I correct, Dr. Rollins? Yeah. So the 550 plus was, was a product that was specifically developed for bird dogs. All right. Anybody? I'll be here and I'll be more than happy to answer questions. So don't hesitate. I appreciate the time. Thank you all very much. Yeah. And Joe Crafton, last I checked, had the largest bid, but, but y'all can beat him and Joe can afford it now. <laughs> Great job, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to tell a story. So um, I live on the Triangle Ranch uh, between Paducah and Kroll, and uh, my husband is a cowboy there, and we've been there 30 years on that on that ranch. And uh, one day we're just sitting in the house eating our ham sandwich for lunch and watching gun smoke, I'm sure. And uh, we hear this beeping noise. <laughs> so we start looking for this beeping noise and Frank's like, what? There's a bird dog out there. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so uh, he said, surely that bird dog ain't beeping. So he went out there and he said, yeah, that collar is beeping on that bird dog. And uh, he, we always just, we, we have a lot of quail hunters out there and uh, he would always just tie their lost bird dogs up in the yard because eventually they'll drive by your house looking for them. <laughs> and uh, that dog beeped all day long. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Frank, he would go out there and he'd uh, look at that collar. He'd like, how do you turn this beeper off? <laughs> he could never figure out how to turn that beeper off. Finally, took the collar off the dog, threw it <laughs> out in the pasture somewhere. <laughs> and because uh, we never figured out how to turn that beeper off. But yeah, anyway, we have a lot of uh, lost bird dog stories and we used to have a lot more before GPS technology. So now we uh, occasionally get, uh, if you see a horse loose in North Cottonwood, it's, I'm okay, but my horse got away from me. So anyway, okay, I got some housekeeping notes for y'all. So um, number one is Ricky Lennox is going to, uh, they will be here tomorrow selling their books, um, Range Plants of North Central Texas. If you always wanted that plant book, it's excellent. And they will be selling it in the morning from 8 to 1030 for $35 cash or check please bring exact change there's an atm in the mcm elegante so uh get correct change so for that um also um last chance to enter the plant and seed id contest so we're fixing to be wrapping that up um the texas wildlife association is sponsoring your social mixer alcohol we have some drinks. If you, unfortunately, if you used, tried to use your drink tickets at Mulligan's last night, anybody do that? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so those, so you got two drink tickets for um, beverages on us tonight at, on 
Texas Wildlife Association, and they also have a, will have a cash bar. Um, the poster session is going to be going on 5.30 to 8.30 tonight. So, and if you've never looked at, uh, been to a poster session, don't know what it is, um, we have some fantastic uh, college students with their research projects, and they will be standing by their posters this evening, and you can ask them questions about their research that they've done related to Bob White or quail, not just Bob White. Um, so the silent auction will close at 7 p.m. tonight. So get those final bids in. Um, and then follow, following the silent auction, uh, we'll you can pay up for your items at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation booth. So we'll be taking credit card checks, whatever you got. So um, so we're going to also have a wonderful dinner here tonight. Joe Allen's Barbecue is back with uh, fajitas, and that is being sponsored by Quail Coalition. So they provided the meal this evening. Also, if today is your... You're headed home. You're not going to be here tomorrow. We ask that you recycle your name tags. There's a box on the Abilene table outside in the foyer. And if you'll stick your name tags in there or leave them on the table for us tomorrow, when you when you head out, just leave your name tags here, okay? And we're going to recycle those. Um, any other? Dale, did I get everything? All right. Well, we hope y'all get to visit with everybody this evening. And um, what? The mixture is going to be where? In the foyer or right here? Uh, so the mixer, so the beverages will be served out of this end concession stand on this side and in the foyer. So they'll have it, have the windows open on both sides. So, that, so supper is going to be served here too. All right. Any other questions for me? All right, y'all have a great evening.